So we are back with our PIPs uh, for uh, FY 2018. I uh, want to just uh, thank my panelists who I have with us today. want to give a quick rundown on who they are before we start. We have Talia Lomax O'Neill, who is the finance director. We have Nancy Shapiro, who, has, who brings her innovation uh, component to this. We have Michael Burcham from the EC and many other places. We have Rich Riebling, who's the COO. And today we are starting off with protecting non-citizens through planning and prevention, which is a uh, PIP from the public defenders. I know we have Wade Monday with us. Wade, you may have brought some people that you would like to introduce with you as you go forward. Uh, I'm going to just remind the viewers at home that we are often asked for more dollars than we will actually have the ability to fund for uh, everything that we would like to fund, but we really appreciate your creativity, your innovation, and thinking outside the box to bring this to us. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. To uh, judge our work for the second year in a row. We appreciate being here in this beautiful space. Again, my name is Wade Monday. I'm the Executive Director of Tennessee Justice for Our Neighbors, a nonprofit serving the immigrant community in Nashville, Tennessee, and the surrounding counties. Uh, with me is Mary Catherine Harcum, the Assistant Public Defender for the City of Nashville, who's been in that role for nearly 12 years now. The that we're proposing is protecting non citizens through planning and prevention. The purpose of which is to respond to immigration and deportation orders that negatively affect families, residents of Nashville, Tennessee. As we see the backlash from current immigration orders at the federal level, level, cities and states are responding by allocating millions of dollars to protect their residents. Columbus, Ohio, not a border state, an immigrant population possibly similar to Nashville's in size, allocated $2.2 million of their budget for removal defense of deportation, an effort to keep families together. Our proposal is innovative because what I believe is an investment of $150,000 in one year can reduce the risk of deportation and the harmful effects caused by that on families and on our communities. The purpose of this PIP proposal is to prevent deportation of non-citizens through a cost-saving and collaborative approach that honors the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, specifically the right to the assistance of counsel as part of a criminal defense. We have a public defender's office that currently provides that right to counsel uh, at a low cost or no cost to the public. And what we're proposing is a response to current immigration practices in federal law that will provide a criminal defense in traffic court and an immigration screening in order to provide an education to non-citizens about their possible immigration relief, whether an undocumented person can become documented through the intervention of an immigration lawyer. The problem as we see it is that there are 5,300 deportations ordered in Tennessee in fiscal year 2016. How in many, many of them were in Davidson County, do you know? Uh, there's, I don't have those specific numbers, okay. no. Okay. Uh, the immigrant, the undocumented immigrant population, according to the Migration Policy Institute, is approximately 50,000, greater than anywhere else in the state. And I will say also that um, immigration is not broken down into county enforcement, obviously on our level of concern. Immigration is not broken down into county enforcement, but um, there are statistics showing that of all of the counties, uh, all of the county jails that send people to immigration, Nashville has by, high, by far the highest number um, of non-citizen inmates which are turned over to immigration. Okay, because I think our, we, we asked for those statistics recently, and I, I don't want to be misquoted, but I'm pretty sure what we were told was it was 562 for Davidson County. Oh, interesting. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah, That's actually yeah, very absolutely. helpful. Um, the economic impact of this is lost tax revenue to the city, uh, but we can't also overstate the fact that these are families that are being torn apart. Um, parents who have newborn children who are being separated from them, uh, U.S. citizen children who are born here, and then the parent is returned to a home country that they've not lived in for nearly two decades. These are specific stories from, from our clients that we hear. Um, Allocating $2.2 million, like Columbus, Ohio has done, is very costly. And the impact of that 
uh, can be easily measured, but the number of people that you serve by that might not be as high as who we can possibly serve through this program. Uh, immigration removal defense, immigrant removal defense uh, is very costly, very time consuming, and it requires an immigration lawyer with expertise in the system and with knowledge of the courts. The court, obviously, in Tennessee is in Memphis. Uh, other related problems. The immigrant community's negative perception of law enforcement comes from, in many cases, their uh, environment in which they grew up, the home countries where law enforcement agencies might be corrupt. Uh, further, the fear that they might be deport deported by local law enforcement agencies if they come forward. And, Again, the emotional impact of deportation. The mental health effects of deportation or the fear of deportation is something that we've surveyed among our clients. Nearly half of them who are undocumented experience severe depression and anxiety as a result of the fear of deportation. Again, the problem, this is a report from the ACLU in 2012. Misdemeanors accounted for 79% of arrests of foreign-born people and for those ultimately placed in removal proceedings. A staggering 67% of their arrests were for level two offenses, which is a driving violation, things such as driving without a license. If someone is driving the streets of Nashville, a mother of four who is undocumented, perhaps she overstayed a student visa, fell in love, got married, and is undocumented now, if she's driving the streets of Nashville with a tail light out, she can be stopped and pulled over and cited for driving without a license. That is a criminal citation that could go on her record and could make her a target for ICE and possible removal from the United States, separating her from her four children. Again, all of my anecdotal uh, stories are from specific clients that we've served. And this is one of those individuals, Rocio. She claimed that in the time that she was undocumented in Tennessee, more than 10 years, she was working and she was driving the streets of Nashville. She altered her lifestyle in order to accommodate this fear that she had. One spouse could only go to the store at a time so that the other wouldn't be, so that they both wouldn't be deported at the same time. One person would be left behind to care for the US citizen children. This is Rocio with her mother on Mother's Day last year. She was finally able to become a U.S. citizen and travel back home after 16 years of separation from her mother. And so she texted this photo with her mother. Uh, she was freed from the fear of deportation through the work of Justice for Our Neighbors. She was provided representation to obtain a U visa. And, and she's, she's now happy and thriving here in Middle Tennessee. You might see her on some billboards around town. She's a model. The size of the impact, individuals like Rocio that we believe we can serve in the first year is 350 out of 4,077 individuals who come through docket 1A in General Sessions Court. Uh, so this is mislabeled, I'm sorry it says deportations ordered. These are the number of people who come through with criminal citations in traffic 1A. Referring back to the ACL report, these are those level two offenses where people can be cited and then ordered deported if, if flagged by ICE. In the first year, we believe we can help 350 people with education, information, and criminal defense. The proposal works in this way. If someone is pulled over for a busted tail light and they're cited for driving without a license, then they go to the sheriff's office and they're booked. Then they're referred to a paralegal who's housed at the public defender's office who is bilingual and who would then be able to identify possible forms of immigration relief, bringing someone from undocumented status to documented status, and then advise them of their rights in the criminal defense matter. In the criminal defense matter, there will be educational uh, stations established so that uh, people who are booked at 1A, who are going to court at 1A, can have a legal defense, someone who advises them, so that the criminal citation does not appear on their record. In most cases, this would involve going to a driver safety class, being informed about proper driving instruction and also what their rights are as a non-citizen in Nashville. And then the immigration process uh, proceeds from there. The individual will be uh, referred to an immigration attorney or possibly justice for our neighbors for representation in whatever possible immigration relief uh, is available for them. The financial model is not 2.2 million, as I said, it's $150,000. Funding two full-time employees uh, employed by Justice for Our Neighbors and housed at the Public Defender's Office. That's the $7,000 match uh, at the bottom of your screen.
the return on investment. Using figures that we've taken from the Migration Policy Institute, we believe that 350 non-citizens who receive these services will pay an estimated half a million dollars in state and local taxes over three years. So for every dollar invested, the city and state receives $3.75 in return. In addition to keeping families together, enhancing the cultural and economic vitality of our city, and improving the relationship between Nashville and the immigrant community. Uh, as we begin to implement this program, we hope that it will be educational for the community to know that the city of Nashville is protecting them through education and through the tools available within our community. So we plan to partner with other nonprofit agencies and provide our services directly to the community. And again, improved mental health, referring back to that survey that we conducted on our clients, uh, the 50% of clients who experience severe anxiety or depression as a result of the fear of deportation have uh, experienced significant reduction in anxiety and uh, depression as a result of simply meeting with an immigration attorney to be informed about what their rights are and what their possible immigration relief uh, is. The team that we've assembled, Mary Catherine Harcum, with 12 years of experience at the Public Defender's Office, who is bilingual, will be supervising the person in criminal court. Adrian Quitos has been an eight-year attorney with Justice for Our Neighbors. Uh, she has some Spanish language profici proficiency, but she would be working with a paralegal who's doing the immigration screening uh, in the Justice to center. And then the timeline, as you see, over three years, culminates with program being absorbed by the Justice for Our Neighbors budget. Uh, we plan to hire program staff in year one, uh, begin criminal re representation in year two. By that point, we believe our clients will be eligible for uh, beginning their immigration proceedings uh, in the Memphis Immigration Court if they're eligible for that. Uh, we'll have program evaluation that we will begin to establish in year one so that we can demonstrate uh, these are the number of people who could have possibly been deported, but were educated and informed of their rights and have not darkened the doors of Docket 1A uh, since the inception of the program. And that is all I have for my presentation. So I, I've got several questions, but I'll, I'll let my panelists go, go first. <coughs> Financial model slide, yes. please. I just want to make sure that I followed your, the attorney would be housed with the public defender? Right. And the paralegal would be with Justice, would, uh, that's they, what I'm trying to, right. can they you would, split that out for me They would please? both be housed in the offices in Cube Space at the Public Defender's Office. They would be employed and supervised by Justice for Our Neighbors. Okay, so both would, Correct. neither would be Metro employees. Correct. Okay. So, so why not? So I guess my question is, if this is something that the PD's office feels is an important expansion of their uh, services, why wouldn't the PD's office be asking for this as part of a budget request for staff. I'm, I'm just part, part of it is because of the expertise in immigration law that Justice for Our Neighbors possesses. Um, not only the attorney representing the client in criminal defense matters, but also the paralegal conducting immigration screening would need some expertise in immigration law. But shouldn't, couldn't our PDs hire an attorney and a paralegal that could fill that gap? Again, I think the issue, so my role at the Public Defender's Office for the past three years has been as our immigration specialist. So I'm a longtime right. criminal defense right. attorney, and what I now do is I advise all of our non-citizen clients um, in the immigration ramifications of their criminal cases. The intersection between criminal law and immigration law is incredibly complex, and the immigration field is incredibly complex. And changing every day. Right. So the, the benefit of this is that it, I am sort of this intermediary person, but the lawyers at JFON have a level of experience such that um, in the immigration system such that they could supervise, uh, train, and ultimately be responsible for the immigration parts of this in a way superior to what we could do at the Public Defender's Office. Is there anybody else in the city that provides similar services? No. And, and I take it JFON is a 501c3? That is correct. So justice for our neighbors, um, is, are, is there an attorney and a paralegal currently employed by JFON? So we would just be assuming their salaries because, or I'm, help me understand what the model is already that we're, are we supplementing this or adding new staff? No, this would be adding new staff. The current paralegal and uh, the legal director of the organization uh, provide solely immigration legal services apart uh, from the criminal 
criminal defense that we're proposing in this model. So and, and let me just add briefly, sure. what many public defenders offices or many cities across the country have started doing is, as Wade described, direct deportation defense. Here in Nashville, that is not uh, a very cost efficient thing to do because the court is in Memphis and most of our clients who are already in deportation proceedings are incarcerated in Louisiana and go to court in Louisiana. So the goal of this is to try to create a hybrid, um, a hybrid representation to address both the low-level criminal charges that keep, get people into the problem in the first place, matched with preventative measures for immigration. Uh, and, and to do that in a way that combines the strengths of both organizations, again, comes in ahead of time, hoping to prevent people from ever getting put into deportation proceedings, because once they're there, there's so little we can do. So th to that point, and going back to um, Ro uh, Rossio, I think, Rossio, uh, so you, you were able to attain, attain a U visa for her, um, and did she ever come into the, the, the system with a driver's license offense or anything? No, she, she did not specifically. Okay, so, what I'm trying to understand is how could we actually let the PD be the ones who need to be adjudicating things that are in the justice system and creating a model with justice for our neighbors such that they're never getting there. So that the actual attorney is devoted not to criminal proceedings, but to uh, proactive outreach into the um, non-undocumented community to help them understand if they can find a path to citizenship. Yes. I mean, but it doesn't sound like that's what this is, right? I think that is something that we hope that this would eventually encompass. So one example that I would like to give you is I have a client right now who is in custody. He first had contact in 2015 with the criminal justice system through a driver's license citation. He did not return to court, has now been arrested because of that, has a three-month-old U.S. citizen child, and in spite of my best efforts, is going to now be deported. Um, there are several ways that this could have been prevented by the program that we are... Tell me how. Instituting. The first is by having actual representation. Which Did he not never, have representation? So during the public defender's office has been located in the 1A docket, but basically as an advisory. So we would often see up to 50 people in a day. You cannot represent 50 people on one docket in three hours. Um, so this person, what he did is he agreed to do a class, but then didn't come back. Had he had a lawyer to help him through that process, the lawyer could have followed up, could have made sure that he did come back, turned in his paperwork, could have turned it in for him, prevented the failure to appear that led to his ultimate arrest. The other issue that could happen is with an immigration attorney associated with this case, if something did happen such that he were put in custody, um, and the immigration attorney could advocate better with ICE. As a Metro employee, I cannot represent him in immigration proceedings, which means even locally, I cannot file what's called a G-28. I have trouble even advocating with local ICE for his bond. Um, were there an immigration attorney involved in this case, involved from the beginning, that person could be much more effective at this sort of later point in at least securing a bond and getting him out of custody. So um, I, I would ask then the, the financial model of 150,000, JFON I know is, is a 501c3 with the, cap the capacity to raise money for this. So what kind of efforts have been put out into the community to help raise the money that would actually provide the funding for this? We have a relationship with the Vera Institute of Justice um, in New York City. We've received operating uh, grants, um, continuous operating grants from the Charles and Mary Grant Foundation in New York City as well. Vera Institute has offered technical assistance and other resources that could help us reach out to foundations around the country to help support this model. Uh, we've also reached out to local foundations, um, family foundations locally specifically to support this program already. Any, and do you have any takers? Uh, the Charles and Mary Grant Foundation in New York, um, Vera Institute of Justice has not committed dollars to it, but technical assistance and resources. Okay. Tell you. I'll follow up <clears throat> on your question because what I'm increasingly hearing is that uh, these folks are afraid to come to court. So they never would even get to a point where you could provide this assistance. Sure. So how do you... How do you get in front of that so that um, they will even show up? So one thing that happens <laughs> 
continues to surprise me about this population is how much they do show up even when it is a risk. I get a lot of calls, JFON gets a lot of calls of people asking if, if they should show up. Um, so, but, so there are a couple of answers. One is when people show up, there's automatically a friendly face there to help them. Two is, uh, we are hoping, as I said, that this person could also do increased outreach in the community. I, for example, already have done a significant bit of outreach with the Public Defender's Office. There's only so much that I can do with my time. Um, the Mexican consulate comes once a month, and that is a great source of people sitting, waiting, a great source of people to give this information to. Uh, and so little by little, the information gets out. Yes, you do need to come. Uh, the other thing is that this has really changed recently. Up until two months ago, people weren't as afraid to come to court. So what we're trying to do is also react to that new fear. Um, this is a community that word travels very much by mouth. And so if people know, you know there is somebody there in court who can help you, that also acts as uh, encouragement for people. To it just come. seems to me that you've got a real opportunity here to partner with some other nonprofits where that trust level already exists and maybe they can send you some referrals where you could do some things um, more proactively on the front end. Conexion or, yes. you know, and also Turk. J Fon is Shalom. located in the same building with Conexion and with Turk. Right. Well, J Fon and I at the Public Defender's Office do work very closely with other community organizations. And, and we receive cross referrals from those organizations all the time, and this would be another program in which they're referring clients to us. So Justice for Our Neighbors is building its reputation within the immigrant community as a place where they can come for resources, a place where they can find people they can trust. Nancy. So many of the people that have come before us um, have said services are siloed. How would you keep partner with other organizations to keep that from happening? I, I think um, the natural response is that we are co-located with so many services, including mental health agencies. Our clients who experience trauma are uh, personally referred to a therapist, a bilingual therapist who sits in the office next door to me. Uh, job training classes at Conexion Americas, which are housed in the same building where they come to receive their legal services. So we're combating that, I think, through the model that's been created at Casa Azafran, uh, which is the building owned by Conexion Americas. And we are continuing to create comprehensive immigration legal services so that more people who experience trauma uh, from their immigration status can receive uh, more comprehensive other services. And this proposal, in essence, allows the Public Defender's Office to piggyback on some of this great non-siloing work that the, has been done in the Latino community. And to follow up, uh, what do you think is the most innovative thing about your approach? that it doesn't cost $2.2 .2 million. <laughs> That's a good thing. And I would say explicitly providing um, both immigration representation and criminal defense representation from the same person. I cannot do that. I can only provide criminal representation with some immigration advice. But having an actual immigration lawyer um, to be able to do both is, is, is critical. Wade, your, your timeline, um, in year three, are, were you saying that you thought then it could become a self-supporting jail? That, that's correct, and part of that could be supplemented by foundations that we reach out to, but also an anticipated uh, increase in earned revenue for some of our programs. Um, as we diversify our revenue streams, we do charge for some services. And as an immigrant becomes undocumented uh, to receiving a work permit to then receiving a green card, as their income escalates, we do begin to charge for their services. So uh, that earned revenue model is one that's been replicated around the country and can help sustain the program. Thank you so much. We appreciate you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. So we are back with our public investment plans for FY 2018. Uh, we have the Metro Volunteer Coordination and Engagement uh, uh, PIP. Uh, we also are joined by uh, uh, Council Member John Cooper is with us today. Uh, Council Member Cooper was also in the previous one with us. I, I don't think I gave you a shout, so um, welcome to have you back today. Uh, we're going to turn it over to you because I know time is quick, and if there's anybody that you would like to introduce while you're doing this, go for it, uh, reminding the viewers at home that we are asked 
for many more dollars than we actually have to allocate, but we really appreciate your creativity and your innovation of thinking about a problem that you're trying to solve. So over to you. All right. Um, well, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to present our plan for um, volunteer engagement with Metro government as well as with Metro employees and volunteering within the community. Um, my name is Stephanie McCullough. I'm the Director of Community Engagement I for the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods. Stephanie, my apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and with me today, I have my boss, Director of Neighborhoods, Lionel Matthews, um, Director of Programs, or Chief Development and Communications Officer, Tara Tenorio, and the Director of Programs, Joseph Call, for Hands on Nashville. Um, as it's been said on a number of occasions, um, the government is not able to do everything. There are a number of challenges that we face as a, as a city that government just can't do all of its, all on its own. And as we've seen in past, past experiences in Nashville, volunteerism is a good way to bring people together to get those, those things done. Um, what's a problem that we face, though, is that volunteerism is not necessarily recognized as a solution to address, addressing the challenges of all the departments in Metro, and we think that that could be something that could, we could change. Um, they either see the number of metro departments that do have volunteer programs, they work well, they're siloed, as we've, as we've heard in the previous, com um, in a number of conversations, or they're agencies that don't think that they can use volunteers to help alleviate some of the problems that they have. Um, and lastly, in our inv investigations into volunteer engagement with Metro, um, there's not a centralized tracking of Metro volunteers to, to, un to understand what we actually are getting from this program. Um, so the purpose of our PIP is to meet community needs through volunteers by both incorporating volunteerism into Metro government and engagement of Metro employees as volunteers. Um, Right now, people kind of see Metro as a metro government as a mystery. A lot of departments, they don't understand how things work. This, I think, would be one way of getting people to understand how, how we work and be able to partner with, with us. Um, the solution we have is three prongs, training, technical assistance, and volunteer engagement. And I'll invite Tara up in a moment to explain the details behind that. But basically, training would be teaching metro departments how to engage with volunteers and, and provide that meaningful volunteer um, experience. And then um, providing the technical assistance with tracking the volunteers. So the first would be the training of, the, of Metro to work with volunteers, creating that, that holistic experience with the volunteers, and then tracking that experience. Um, our size of impact, well, it could be the entire city, depending on how we, do, how we manage this. Um, I, in my slides, I usually focus on the numbers because this has all kind of been like in a business plan, but for me, it's also about having communities engage with one another and get to know each other. So getting to know my government, getting to know your neighbors, and being in, more involved with each other. Um, so the impact could be the 680 some thousand people in Metro with the 50 departments that we have and um, amplified that by the amount that each volunteer could provide. Um, some of the stats that we have, volunteers can provide the equivalent of 15 full-time employees, which would be over a half million dollars worth of value to the city. And that was based on some of the research from Ideas to Reality team that was talking about volunteer engagement in the past. Um, so at that, I would like to have Tara come up and talk about the details of our partnership with Hands On Nashville. Yeah, I'll leave it with you. I'll hold it. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Tara Tenorio, and I'm the Chief Development and Communications Officer with Hands on Nashville. Thank you again for allowing us to be here with you today. Um, so I want to point back really quickly to the, the purpose of our slide, which is to invite the community to engage with Metro departments as volunteers, and also to recognize that our Metro employees are volunteers themselves. Um, so looking at both of those two opportunities to really tell the story of Nashville as a community of service. And so when I, we look up at the slide, I wanna point, put some definitions to uh, these bullet points. So when we talk about volunteer engagement training, the purpose behind that um, is to really focus our efforts on how to strategically use volunteers to meet community needs. Um, and so historically, when you've heard people talk about volunteer training, it's really about the volunteer experience. We're trying to take that shift and invite Metro, Metro government 
departments to really say, how can we maximize the potential of these community volunteers to help us address the issues we have at hand? So we do that through the uh, implementation of what's called a service enterprise model. Um, Points of Light developed this training for uh, affiliates like Hands On Nashville, volunteer resource agencies across the nation um, to make sure that we can make volunteerism um, effective, not just accessible. So the next piece points to volunteer tracking. This is really all about technology. Um, so being able to post our opportunities that the, the government departments might have, post them online for the public to see, to learn about what the issues are, and then to be able to sign up to engage. So from there, what we can do is tell the department heads who's serving, how often they're serving, when they're serving, um, and really focus on telling that story of service. That final piece is pointing back to Metro employees as volunteers. Um, so what we know about public service is that it's not just a nine to five gig. Um, so really being able to look at the volunteer hours that each Metro employee is offered, um, that was started with Mayor with Mayor Dean and is carried on by Mayor Barry. Um, so again, all points back to being able to tell that Nashville is truly a city of service um, and, and being able to say what model that is for the rest of the country. Thanks, Tara. Okay, so our business model, for lack of a better phrase, um, who we're talking about with this project are the Metro Departments. Again, some have existing volunteer programs, some want to utilize volunteers but don't really know how, um, and some need assistance to kind of get leadership behind the idea of getting volunteers in the programs. Um, we're asking for $14,500 total, um, $13,500 for developing of a message and outreach to metro agencies to invite them into this cohort model that we're, that we're thinking about, and then the actual cohort training, which would be $12,000. Um, and so we're partnering with Hands on Nashville and to collaborate with this service enterprise training program that Tara spoke about and to provide recruitment and tracking for the internal and external volunteers, as we've said. Um, so the impact. Again, the, what they, the statistics usually say for every dollar an organization invests in volunteer engagement, they can expect a $6 return on investment. That's just one part of the story. Again, you get that the idea of just the, the mental and the, the, the fulfillment of being a volunteer, especially when you're in a meaningful, well-crafted volunteer experience. Okay, and so the team that we have. So, um, Joseph and I will be leading this project. Joseph Call is, um, he's our specialist on the Service Enterprise Project. Um, as part of my job, it is to engage volunteers for the mayor's office, so I would like to learn a little more about how best to do that and to provide those meaningful experiences. Um, and, we, and we'll work together on developing a cohort to model for this first kind of, this test. Okay, so our launch plan, um, so, if we receive the funding, the first bit would be to create and distribute an invitation to the Metro Departments to apply for the first cohort. And so um, we're thinking four departments as this first cohort to kind of work through the process. It's a 16, it's a 40 hour program for every other Friday for two months. Um, get them involved, get them trained, and then they would participate from September to October. And then moving forward from that, from November to, I have February, but then thinking through some of the warmer months where you would have more volunteers being outside, being able to measure and, and test the volunteer engagement plans that the, develop that the departments have come up with. And so, um, and talking about sustainability, so the next steps with that, of course, the, the $1,000 that I mentioned would be to help would be to pay for um, maintenance of the database of volunteers that we have and be able to access that. But, in a, but also um, thinking about in sustainability, I'm sorry. Um, so the sustainable part would be the logistics of maintaining the database, but also about the cultural change in having the volunteers be involved with Metro and vice versa. Um, I've talked to a couple of people in Metro schools, which is where um, Metro employees are allowed to volunteer for the two, um, two hours a week, and they're having a couple of, a little bit of a hiccup tracking their mission right now because they've switched systems. So this would almost serve as like a, as our way of tracking who is doing what in this, in that program. Um, so with this, I think, I hope it would be able to lift the veil on how we deal with a Metro government in general, get more people involved with it, get people to understand what we do and what we don't do, and um, 
make a change in the city. So, thank you. Great. So, I, I have a couple questions really quickly. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to point out to the viewers at home who can see this uh, that. April 22nd is a great day to yes. get out and clean up your neighborhood. Um, those are just a couple. I think we have 63 yes. registered cleanups around our city on, on uh, April 22nd. So uh, that's just pitch that out there. Okay. Um, one of the great ways we do engage volunteers once a year, twice a year sometimes for the, for the cleanups, but I'd like to do that in a larger scale. So Stephanie, a couple questions. Ma'am. All right, so first of all, uh, I wanna go back to understand what, what the cohort is actually gonna do. So you, you said 40 hours every Friday for? It's 40 hours total. So they would meet for four hours every Friday for two months. To every do other what? Friday. Well, Joseph, would you like to explain the model? Sure. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Joseph. Thanks again for having us here. Uh, I'm the Director of Programs at Hands-On Nashville. Um, the service enterprise model uh, starts with an application, so we would ask that Metro departments apply to be a part of the first cohort. Um, we do a two-hour orientation, that's a face-to-face -face classroom orientation. It starts to build the, the teamwork and the camaraderie with the cohort. Um, and then we have a research-based diagnostic test um, that's called the Service Enterprise Diagnostic, the SED. Um, and then we get into the, the sort of the meat and potatoes of what Service Enterprise is. It's a change management curriculum. Uh, so it is about getting departments or organizations to rethink how they engage volunteers or to think for the first time about how they engage volunteers. And so that's done um, through a series of trainings, four trainings, um, those are each four-hour trainings. That's the, um, the time that Stephanie is referring to that's the, in the classroom. Um, and that would be every other Friday for two months. Um, and, and so it would take organizations, their leadership, their on-the-ground staff. Um, it would take those organizations through the process of rethinking volunteer engagement. Um, and then... Are you guys doing this for any other organizations? I mean, are you doing this through other not-for-profits? Are you doing this for other uh, entities, like for-profit companies? Or, talk to me for about that. Yes, yeah, so we're currently doing our first cohort right now with uh, five non-profits, and uh, we are about to have our third in-class training session this Friday. Um, across the country, there's, um, I don't wanna misquote the stat, but I think there's about like 100 service enterprises. Um, you get certified, but once you go through this process, you, you go through the diagnostic, you go through the training. Um, we work with the organization to then become certified as a service enterprise. So the long-term goal would be to have the city of Nashville be certified as a service enterprise. Okay. Uh, the, the, the technology, I think you have a technology request. How might this fit into the technology request we saw yesterday, which is the hub, which is a whole very expensive thing that we're doing. How would that fit into this at all, if any, if in any way? Uh, well, the hub doesn't have the, the capabilities that Hands-On Nashville has the infrastructure already set up to, to track this type of volunteerism. Um, to put something like, like tracking volunteerism on the contact center staff will, will require probably more people in the contact center and require additional resources. Uh, I think for $1,000 a year, I think you get more bang for your buck outsourcing a, a service like this than trying to include it in, in the and Michael. So I, I wanna I wanna make sure I completely understand. The 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 monies requested is actually the fee for the points of lights foundation training and their subscription fee to maintain the Metro database. Is that what that is? That's what the majority of the ask is for. There's okay. another 1,500 to talk about how to craft the messaging to get. I understand, but the bulk of the re request is to pay the licensing fee to the Points of Light Foundation to do training and to maintain a database. Well, to, to hands on Nashville. Hands on, which is part of Points of Light yes. Foundation out of Atlanta, yes. right? Mm -hmm. it's, so it's not a governing body of. 
But it's I, the I'm, training is the training is from the Points of Light yeah. Foundation. It's Correct. a canned. You pay the fee, so you can do the training. You take a piece, they take a piece. Is so that how that works? We're certified by Points of Light to deliver the to training. To deliver the training, yes. on their training. Okay, yes. I just want to make sure I understood exactly what the fund was for. It's for the training and the maintenance of the database. Yes. Okay. I have a question about technology. I think I heard you say two things. I want to make sure that I heard them correctly. Okay. The, the technology will allow us to track not only volunteer activity of Metro employees, where they actually go in there and sign up to do things, but also allow us to put volunteer opportunities out there for other people to sign up exactly. for things that we want to sponsor. Right. So it's doing both. Yes. Okay. And, and then to be able to report back to those departments saying who those people are when they're serving, to let them, so you can basically have all of that reporting data back. Okay, so are you thinking that, you mentioned MMPS, that MMPS might participate in this with us? It's a possibility. We haven't had many conversations with them about that. I was just thinking about that overlap. Right. So, well, if they, if they decide to keep their process, then they're willing to share that information with us. But right now, as we as we as we've have it, have it right now, it's not very accurate. I know because that's really been a challenge, I think, for our human resources department to track right. those volunteer hours that Metro employees are spending in the schools. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if there was maybe an opportunity here to. Yes, we're. In, I've been discussing that <laughs> as a possibility. Mm -hmm. Because this is only going to track the Metro employee that are doing any volunteers with hands on Nashville. This is not tracking all Metro volunteer employee hours. Is that correct? Correct. But we would we would pro, we would promote it as a way to track that information. Specifically, specifically looking at Executive Order 12 was was kind of right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but that's it, not that's not. Uh, service through Hands on Nashville is with MMPS, but right now Pencil used to track that when it was first started. Pencil stopped tracking it. Uh, Metro schools were they were trying to track it through uh, the system Raptor, mm -hmm. where people have to check in at the school. It wasn't a very good good tracking model. So right now, like like Talia said, HR has a very difficult time tracking the number of hours Metro employees are actually spending in Metro schools, according to. to so but this isn't going to help that. Yes. Okay. It would. Okay. And how? That's, how? that's my question. How? Because it sounded like this was a, a different model about posting and getting volunteers for projects that are specific to Hands on Nashville. Oh, I think it's a oath. That's why. I don't know. Is that my phone? I don't know. I have no idea. We'll, we'll figure it out here in a second. So, Mayor, if you were to volunteer at Glencliff Elementary, right. then you could go onto the website through your account and say, and you can self-report hours. So that is that is one of the ways to do it, is to make sure that as people are going to volunteer that they're reporting those hours in the database. Um, but so through hands on Nashville. Correct. This would not be something that Metro has. This would now be giving you information data on Metro employees about what they're doing. Right. Yes. Okay. That, uh, that's to report I, back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's what I also want to understand. Um, go ahead. The, the local companies that are going through the training today, who all is involved in it today and going through the training locally here? Who would be the key partners to the city? I'll try to think of the five organizations. Um, Two or three is good. Just Friends is good. Life uh, is Friends Life Community, um, the Pet Community Center. Um, I knew I was going to draw a blank if I was asked this question. Um, <laughs> So you can, you can just uh, give, it, give it to Brian and yeah, give that back to us, it's fine. I'm just curious as to who are the collaborative partners in the training. Right. And, and last and not, um, for my questions, you mentioned that in the previous administration that they did this, how did they track it? <coughs> huh? Through pencil originally. So, 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 all the hands, so all the volunteer stuff that Metro employees did was all done through pencil? From my understanding, yes. Right, but I mean, wasn't there stuff with hands on Nashville too? You, I, one of y'all mentioned that that was part of the previous administration. I'm just there trying was. to see. There was during the during the flood. A lot of the uh, volunteer right. um, opportunities were through hands on Nashville. Was there a tracking mechanism? Yes. Yes. And so, what happened to it? Uh, they actually provided a. Um, uh, 
brought that data to us because we were able to claim those hours as in-kind contributions. Right, for, I remember for when we had the FEMA rumors. stuff and everything. So, that was, so we appreciate so what, you what, for. Yeah, so what happened, <laughs> what happened to that? Is that a database that still existed? It's the same database that Hands on Nashville has. So we'd be able mm -hmm. to, if you were to say, I need every, everybody that has an at Nashville.gov, then we can send that to you. We pull that report and then send it back to you. Or if, the, if a department head wanted that information on a monthly basis or weekly basis, you can automate the reporting to, to come to you as often as you want it. Okay, and that's only gonna cost $1,000? Correct. That's good. Okay, any other questions? Um, Nancy. I have one. Yes, uh, could you explain a little bit about um, the legal liability or the, uh, our Metro, employees covered on their volunteer hours? Uh. Um, I think the, the way it works is that, which is kind of strange that they would stop, sw um, switch from pencil because you have to go into pencil and sign, you know, and, ha and get your background check through right. that system and okay. then you sign your waivers through there. And so as it is right now, every department who does volunteerism has their own waivers that say this, that, or the other. We would want to be able to consolidate that into one kind of universal waiver, or at least have that tailored to the different types of volunteerism okay. as we, that we distribute. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Rich, anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are back uh, with our public investment plan, FY 2018. Uh, we are uh, going to hear now of the Drive to End Chronic Homelessness, the Homelessness Commission and Social Services. Uh, we have Judith with us. Uh, I'll let you introduce some of the other wonderful folks you brought with you as appropriate during your presentation. Want to recognize that we usually have uh, um, Council Member John Cooper with us. I'm sure he'll be back. Uh, um, and uh, also then to just uh, remind the folks at home that we have more dollars that are asked for than we have dollars to spend. So we appreciate you already taking time to think through a, an issue and be creative and innovative about how to solve it. So thank you all for being here. I'll just turn it over to you. Good morning. I'm the uh, interim director of the Metropolitan Homelessness Commission. I forgot my name. It's Judith Tackett. And uh, today I present the Drive to End Chronic Homelessness Program. Mobility is a key factor in the health and well-being of a community. Transportation plays a big role when we talk about equity. And that's why Drive to End Chronic Homelessness focuses on providing access to services for our most vulnerable neighbors. In a 2010 study, the federal government listed the following barriers to access to mainstream services. Communication, a lack of re a regular address, missing documentation, and transportation. Based on our annual one night count, Nashville has an estimated 2,300 to 2,400 people who experience literal homelessness at any given point in time. Literal homelessness refers to people that are um, staying in emergency shelters, on the streets, in encampments, and in places not meant for a human habitation. Of this population, people experiencing chronic homelessness have the biggest barriers to housing. That is why during year one, Drive to End Chronic Homelessness will provide 500 annual bus passes at no cost to individuals who are 18 and older and have been experiencing or are at risk of chronic homelessness. Chronic homelessness means that a person has been homeless for a year or longer and has a disabling condition, or the person has a disabling condition and has experienced four episodes of homelessness in the past three years that add up to a year or longer. We all know bus passes alone are not gonna end homelessness. That's why Drive to End Chronic Homelessness includes three key aspects. One, bus pass recipients must be working with a housing navigator on housing. Two, our Metro partners provide training to employees on trauma-informed care and other best practices so that we know how to interact with people in crisis. And three, MTA, police, Metro Social Services, and our homeless outreach team will partner to move from an enforcement-only model to a social services approach when we engage people experiencing homelessness at bus stations and transit stations. 
a study in uh, 2006 that surveyed 75 transition transit organizations showed that moving to a social services model that links people with services rather than bans them immediately from a location makes housed and unhoused people and passengers of, of um, MTA and bus transit systems feel safer. So who will we be surf serving? There's a typo on this and you may have found it. Um, so our 26 point in time count showed 2,365. It's 2,365 people experiencing literal homelessness during one night in January. Of those 978 were estimated to be chronically homeless. We would like to measure the following outcomes for drive to end chronic homelessness. Length from street to housing for bus pass recipients, the number of services and types of services provided, the number and nature of calls that we receive from the public at MTA, at the mayor's office, at the Homeless Commission and Social Services, and we expect to see an increase in participation and information through our housing navigation process. Housing navigators are outreach workers, case managers, and social workers. They work at about 20 service provider agencies throughout the community, most of them nonprofits. And the Homelessness Commission provides a housing navigation training which streamlines the process of how our community assists people who transition from the streets into permanent housing. Drive to end chronic homelessness will be implemented the following way. A housing navigator applies for a person through a community's homeless management information system. This is a shared database that we are building up right now. The application will include proof of a disabling condition and the length of time a person has been experiencing homelessness, a signed code of conduct, an agreement to work with a housing navigator on housing, and once approved, the commission will then print out the annual actual bus pass. And that's kind of a little bus card with a photo, uh, the name and uh, birth date on it. Every 90 days, housing navigators will report to the Homelessness Commission that a bus pass recipient is still actively engaged with them and works towards housing. If a person obtains housing after, let's say, four months, they can re uh, they will remain and receive that bus pass for the remainder of the year, but they have to still be working um, on removing barriers to housing and remain successful in housing. And they have to be working with a, a, a community provider, a case manager on that. Bus passes can be deactivated if a person has too many violations of the code of conduct, if a person is no longer working with a housing navigator or case manager, or if a card is lost and needs to be replaced. It can also be reactivated if a person is back on working towards housing. After one year, um, the Homelessness Commission will review whether to extend a bus pass for a person. The budget is straightforward. We are asking for a total of $250,000. In comparison, Portland, Oregon spends $1.5 million for a program that re reduces transit costs for low-income populations. Many cities also have uh, free bus routes like MTA's Music uh, City Circuit in downtown Nashville. What is unique though about Drive to End Chronic Homelessness is that we link our program with a community goal, we, with an existing process and a database, and we focus specifically on access to services and housing. Let's talk about our return on investment. Cost studies across the nation show that ending chronic homelessness saves money. The average cost saving of the five cities listed on this slide is over 50%. Cost savings are mainly in healthcare and criminal justice systems. Study after study show that assisting a person who experienced chronic homelessness with permanent supportive housing saves about $20,000 a year per person. By simply housing one additional person per month, this program will pay for itself. The Homelessness Commission will serve as the overall lead agency. MTA will lead on the Train the Trainer program. The Police Central Precinct and Metro Social Services with, will partner with our homeless outreach team to shift from an enforcement only to a social services model and engage people who are homeless at bus stations and along bus routes. We have an implementation timeline of about three months 
policies and procedures are in place in month one. Printing of the cards is set up and trained a trainer program launched in month two and by month three we hope the first bus drivers are actually en route to wherever they need to get services, get food, get health care, whatever they need. This is Jerry. On the left you see him one day before moving into his own apartment. On the right you see him 14 days after his move-in. That is two weeks. Literal homelessness is lethal. Too many men and women who are part of our community pay the price. Since January this year alone, I know 15 people who have passed away while being homeless and experiencing literal homelessness in Nashville. Drive to end chronic homelessness makes sense. It is cost effective, it is outcome oriented, and it addresses a huge equity issue. But above all, it has the potential to save lives. I would like to thank India Birdsong, MTA's Chief Operating Officer, Julie Navaretti, MTA's Chief Development Officer, and Renee Pratt, Executive Director of Metro Social Services, to join me here today. I also would like to thank uh, John Drake, Commander of the Downtown Central Precinct, and my own team for their participation in putting this proposal together. Thank you. Great. Uh, questions, folks? Natalia? Yeah, question. Go, go ahead. What, what are these folks doing today? Uh, right now, um, we are scrambling. Community providers pay for bus passes. We pay for, have a budget item for bus passes. That's right now about, we, we have it through a grant of $10,000, and we never have enough. Okay, so how much do you think? The community is currently investing in this. If you can, you know, are there, or uh, is there only one nonprofit in the community no, that it's, helps, it's or are there 50 of them that provide health bus passes? Club, park Center, Room in the Inn, Park Center is spending about $12,000 in their, in, in their budget, and they have run out. So all of those together is probably less than this $200,000 request? Uh, it probably is, but it's also, it's not even coming close to where the need is. And also, when we look at studies, um, I'm going back to that study that looked at uh, across the country at uh, 65 um, transit organizations that really um, showed the need for uh, for this and also uh, for a collaboration between social services and, and, and transit systems. Okay, so with that gap, what are they doing? What, what they are doing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are, and actually I, um, yeah, I have it in, in the proposal. There is um, different organizations, different cities approaching this differently, but none of them link it to the housing and services provider need as we do. Um, let's, uh, in Portland, they really uh, have also, on top of what I cited in my presentation, they provide grants up to $30,000 for organizations to purchase bus passes and then use it and, and give it out to the populations they think is um, necessary. Uh, another city, it's, it's usually discounted bus pass prices that they offer to uh, provider services. Who's making sure the tickets get in the hands of who they're supposed to be in, the tracking and all that, is that mm -hmm. you? Yes, it, we have at the Homelessness Commission, we're building a coordinated entry system and that is linked to this database that I uh, um, mentioned in here, Homeless Management Information System. Uh -huh. And then our outreach team will have a log where, where they also check um, that every three months, housing navigators are checking in. They're checking in with us on a bi-weekly basis anyway. Okay. Um, so this is just gonna be an additional uh, check-in and an additional information that we uh, request from them that people are, that they are still um, working with people. Year one, and that's why we're here, is really gonna also establish some baselines mm -hmm. so that we can see, for example, Example, it's really important that we find out how long it takes for people who are chronically homeless to uh, obtain housing. Mm -hmm. And this process, the way we set it up, and this whole project will help with that. And then we can move and see where are the gaps when it takes 200 days, that's way too long. We need to get it to 90 days or below. And and where are the, the gaps and, and yeah. how do we as a city address that? And how many agencies share that database on a homeless individual so they know the services they need and how they're getting them off the street? Um, I 
don't know exactly. I know the 20 partners that we have and uh, are all going to share it. And so it's going to be between, it's pretty much anybody who works on homelessness that we are trying to get into that database. We're building it up right now. So, mm -hmm. so what percentage of these uh, people that will receive the bus passes do you estimate have untreated mental illness? I don't know, but um, generally it's uh, what I've read. It's, it can be up to 30% or more. 30%? Yes. And those are the things that when I say I don't know, this is information that by putting this into our coordinated entry system and in our homeless management information system, we can get more information about this population. So for me, a big value of this whole program is also to, to get a better picture of the population. We're, we're trying to end chronic homelessness, so we need to really know who are the people, what are the gaps, what are the characteristics. And frankly, and I've had that conversation with the mayor before, I right now um, I think we can do a, a better job on data collection and information collection. And this would help with that. So, so first of all, thank you. Um, I appreciate everything that you do to help our folks who are unhoused on any given night um, find housing. Uh, the 972 that you mentioned of our point and count from last year, this would this would help 500. Uh, what about the other 472? Um, one of the key aspects is to get everybody connected to a housing navigator. Okay, and that, so is that what we can is, serve we at the moment? We think we can manage to set up everything we need and have the baselines and <clears throat> that we come back next year okay. for a more uh, in-depth proposal uh, based on the baselines and what we find and, and, I think and, it's, and can ask them for more then. I think it's important to say that you've also asked for in, um, in the budget process some navigators Yes. That, that it's not that's separate from this that would also coordinate with this. Going back to the Portland model, uh, just curious, this, this idea that you try to just grant those specifically to the organizations who are closest with the, the folks who are ex experiencing the transit and the homelessness, why did you decide that that wasn't the better way to go? I mean, uh, I think it's really about, um, a lot of it is about information collection and, okay. and setting up the whole process and having a streamlined process. And I think this allows us to give more control uh, over that streamlining the entire process, how we address chronic homelessness. I mean, I know that's always been the challenge is trying to, to actually gather the data. And bus passes are a huge incentive yeah. to people. Remind me, because we used to track this when I was on the Homeless Commission, how many bus passes did we give out last year? Do you remember? Like, what the dollar amount was? Uh, about ten thousand dollars worth. This is only ten. Mm, okay. I'm asking. Yeah, in, in this budget, I'm asking for for that being back in there. <laughs> so, so you're you're asking for that ten over, uh, in the homeless commission budget, because, part of social services, but also yes. then to add this additional different yes. program. Because and you have to remember there are different populations of right. we, this is just chronic. Right. And and so this is for chronic, and the bus pass is actually designed to get them to a service. I mean that's the whole point. Yes. Yes. Um, connecting them, and we'll be tracking that to see that they're using the bus for yeah. that. Um, yeah. And it's it's they can use people can use the bus pass as they need. But by being connected to a housing navigator, we will hope we will, and that's the goal to measure what progress they make towards housing and what services they access. So it's not a, um, it's really this relationship in, between housing navigator and the person seeking housing is very important, and this can also, it, this actually will help strengthen that relationship and make it more consistent. Okay, Michael. Can you go back to your homeless count slide? Do you have the demographics on this in terms of age? And the reason I ask that is because I know that youth can get free bus passes already. Mm -hmm. So is, do you have that data? I, 18. And, I'm just, and Metro Public Schools. Exactly. So, but I'm just wondering how many of those are in this count? Um, maybe about 30. Yeah. 
30 Not out many. of that? Yes, because youth so is very, tiny. Yeah, okay. yeah. Youth is very hard to count. And the mayor has, thank you so much for coming out in January this year. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard. This is a one night count. Okay. So it's not a really, we need to improve our data through homeless management information system to have a better picture. This one night count is a snapshot and to catch youth in a snapshot is tough. Well, I, I know Metro Schools tracks homeless yeah. kids that's and a that's a different, pop I just want to make sure I'm yeah. following. No, and question, the definition Talia. is also different. We really, the Homelessness Commission really focuses on HUD definitions right okay. now, what I cited, and the school definition, education definition is a little um, wider. Okay. Rich. Yeah, I think, I just want to make sure I understand the, the concept is, is uh, on how you're going to pick and choose who gets it, and, and then the, I think it's critical that there be the, the tracking mechanism so that they're continuing to get the services. And walk through that one more time, just to make sure I understand it, because I think that's so important. It's not just a, yes. we're giving people bus passes to go ride the bus, right. no. but there's a, there's a, there's a real mm -hmm. method to this. And, and make yes. sure, just kind of go through that one more time, yes. make sure we understand that. And it, it, uh, so a housing navigator applies for this bus pass through a coordinated entry system. So just going through the coordinated entry system will already uh, collect some data on the person, some statistics, some age range, and, and then we also will have a proof of chronicity. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to say length of homelessness because people at risk of homelessness will be, um, um, and, and when I say that it's about six months of homelessness and a disabling condition, they can apply to uh, through a housing navigator. Um, and having the coordinated entry system is already in a homeless management information system database. So that will help us um, track who's in there, who has a bus pass, and the homeless management information system eventually will also capture what some of the services are that housing navigators provide. And in addition to that, we do have every, every two weeks um, community meetings that are called care coordination. And we have one for uh, people experiencing chronic homelessness where provider agencies come together and, and look at who are some of the most vulnerable people. There it can be identified who are the people that, you know, if we have some bus passes that we also need to reach out to them to, to see if they are um, interested, willing, and if, if they're going to um, be willing to work towards housing through that. So I, I think what I heard was the housing navigator is the one that actually yes. starts the process. There is a, a, yes. some kind of a component. And they're the ones who find the Yes. Coordinate the housing. Yes. So, so it's, there's a yes. consistency it's, there yes. where the, the individual would know kind of who they're dealing with. Yes. And, all that. So, okay. and we already have a training, and this will be the housing navigator will be trained what the application contains and what needs to be submitted to get an application. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And I just want to give a quick shout out. Uh, Council Member Berkeley Allen has also joined us. We appreciate you, Berkeley. Uh, thank you for coming down. Appreciate you guys. We are back with our public investment plans for FY 2018. We have the fire department with us, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, Commander Swan with us, who's going to walk us through. I know you brought some other folks. If you want to introduce them at some point during the presentation, as appropriate. I want to just also give a quick shout out that we have Council Member John Cooper with us. Uh, this is a presentation on a move toward diversity through education, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you for being here. One last reminder we, to the folks at you and the folks at home that we are oftentimes asked for more dollars than we actually have uh, dollars to spend. So we appreciate your uh, thoughts about trying to be innovative and uh, to solve a problem. So with that in mind, over to you. All right. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to present our program and plan for you from the, uh, from the National Fire uh, Department's perspective. And basically, um, what we're trying to do in, is present a program uh, to your office. And this program will be uh, able to motivate and um, inspire youth in our local community, uh, and hopefully to obtain uh, the, the skills that's needed to be hired either for the National Fire Department or in any uh, department uh, within our infrastructure. Our goal here is to um, enable them not just to live here, uh, to go to school here, but also work here. So 
With that being said, um, with this program, we hope to eliminate race-based disparities in the greater Nashville community while promoting inclusion and engagement of our community youth. <clears throat> And we understand when we start talking about framing the problem, we know that minorities are systematically under representative in public uh, employment. We know that uh, culture differences hamper the sense of togetherness and belongingness. And we also know that culture differences create problems in terms of uh, conflict res resolution. So it is important that the government agencies uh, represent the citizens that they serve. So the citizens of Nashville, of course, go to their elected officials, uh, councilmen and councilwomen, and they uh, demand diversity. And I found an interesting article. The Bookings Institute uh, was released in May of 2016, and basically they do a survey on the top 100 cities. Nashville was ranked fifth for growth, 10th for prosperity, but 73rd for inclusion. That number sort of stuck out like a sore thumb, and but it also um, made sense to why, why uh, our mayor is actually pushing so much for all of the departments to have inclusion and diversity, which the National Fire Department was on board with this uh, a long time ago uh, as far as Chief White's um, coming into the department. So. To make clear and clarity on this, I want to just for a second talk about what is diversity. I think we use that term, but some people may not know what it means. In a broad term, diversity is any division that can be used to differentiate groups and people from one another. It means respect for and appreciation of difference in ethnicity, gender, age, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, education, and religion. We know the power of diversity is unleashed when we respect and value the differences. And then the word inclusion, what is that? Inclusion is a state of being valued, respected, and supported. It's about focusing on the needs of every individual and ensuring the right conditions are in place for each person to achieve his or her full potential. So in short, and in, um, inclusion treasures diversity and builds community. Uh, Mayor, you talked a lot about the youth summit that you attended. Um, and in that youth uh, summit, you said that they were mostly needing the needs, to, uh, access to opportunities, skill, hope, and yes, paychecks. And I know with the opportunity now, you're pushing this summer is going to really help that situation out. But our program is going to hit that head on. Uh, so with every problem, we must bring a solution. So the solution that we're bringing to you today, our mentoring program from the National Fire Department's perspective, what we're going to do is go into the local schools. Uh, it's going to be our primary target. Uh, I've given you some other materials just because of lack of time not to have to mention all of them. But we're going to go into many, many places, but especially our local school because we're going to target the youth. Uh, and what we're going to do is encourage um, teamwork, learning skills, leadership skills, um, some challenges, learn how to work hard have fun, and of course, build friendships. Uh, I think that this program is going to be able to uh, enable students and young people, if they, if they want to get hired on the National Fire Department, they'll know what skills are required of them and what abilities that they'll need to bring with them. If they choose not to go to the National Fire Department, then we're going to do other things for them. We're going to help them out and point them in other directions. We don't want this just to be about the fire department, of course. We want them to have an opportunity to grow in any field that they want. But of course, being a little selfish, we are going to push them toward our way. We know that the data that's provided, when we start looking at the impact of it, of course, the people that's mostly affected is our, our diverse population. Um, of course, it's why we're targeting our Davidson County schools. The 12 uh, core schools, which I handed that out to you, is very important to look at because they hit more of the inner cities. Uh, a lot of, of, of some of the forgotten people. Um, Nashville's a melting pot. It's, it's, divide, it's, um, it's made up of many different ethnic groups and people. So what we're trying to do, again, we're talking to everybody, but we really want to target on our low income and also uh, on our uh, youth. The data that we provide when it talks about who's going to be affected, 
we know anytime we do good things, good things happen. So I can't tell you what the number will be of positivity, but we know if we get out and we be good mentors and good uh, teachers, it's going to make a positive impact some way, somehow. So how are we going to make it work? This is a program in a nutshell. Basically, we'll have mentors from our department go into the public schools, and they will go in, they'll be like big brothers, big sisters. They'll talk about the skills that's required of them to be able to advance in, in, in life, not just the fire department, but just being good citizens, learning how to uh, use the HOPE program to hopefully encourage them to go on and continue their education. If they uh, choose to do this, and let's say they, they pick, uh, they want to be an EMT, and that's what we're hoping, they can go to a community college, a two-year school for free, um, and they can get their two-year uh, 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 associate's degree, or they can even get a certificate that will take about eight months. So what our program will provide is we'll have, a, this student will have a mentor to follow them from high school to college, and then after they graduate college, uh, to get hired on the National Fire Department, you gotta be 21 years of age. So you could have a student at, eight, at 18 that graduate from high school, go to college, and invest their time and get their certificate. At this point in time, they could be 19. So what do I do now with this certificate? Well, we've partnered with a lot of the local ambulances and uh, local uh, um, uh, ERs, uh, hospitals and doctor offices. So we're gonna take this person from college and help them get a job so that when they get through with school, they can earn the paycheck that you were talking about, Mayor, and they can put their, um, uh, their, their degree or their certificate to work. After that, if they, uh, once they return, uh, turn 21 years of age, this will be the prime person that we want to bring on to the National Fire Department because they invested their time in our program. So we're not going to just start this program and leave them. We're going to go and walk, walk through them from high school all the way through college and then even helping them get employment afterwards. So the, the thing this, uh, that probably will grab most of your attention is this model here. This is what we're asking for is to provide three paramedics. And the reason why we have this issue, when we went to Vol State and talked to them about being prepared for the influx of students that they're gonna have uh, coming into their college, they informed us already because the demand is so high with the EMT program that they turn people away all the time. So here we were in school uh, promoting them to go to, to father their education and be better, and yet when they go to college to try to get their EMT, they're turned away. So how can we solve this problem? So talking to the president of all state, they agreed that if we had the, the teachers, then what these students would, would be doing, they wouldn't be competing against the outside forces, they would only be competing against the ones that's in our program. So in short, if we had these teachers, the students will only be competing against each other. So they'd be pretty much guaranteed um, to be able to come into the program, to get their EMT license, uh, and then immediately start work. I mean, making $15, $16 an hour. But we have to have the staff um, in order to provide this, um, uh, this opportunity for them. I also handed you a um, this is our worst case scenario. This is our topped out medics, uh, bachelor's degree, uh, top of the line, but we also uh, I sent or hand, handed you more of a, um, uh, of, a, of a more realistic where we can pull from. I just wanted to give you the top so it wouldn't be a shocker to you. We're, we're looking at about $70,000 difference, you know, coming in um, on the lower end. Uh, return on our vet, uh, of our, uh, return on our investment, of course, sustainability in the communities. We know that when every, when a community will have a, a sustainability, when each person has the opportunity to thrive, and of course benef benefit from the opportunities that, that the society has for it. We know that the mission is to create new ideals and promote public policies that pr uh, produce uh, equal opportunities and a better future for all youths and minorities, and, and again, especially for those uh, more or less left behind. <clears throat> Uh, Jerry uh, Schwerk here, this is an interesting thing that I uh, found. And trying to find out about mentoring programs, uh, we know that 
he made a, a big point that stuck out to me. If you're going to provide a mentoring program, this is what you have to do. You got to make sure that you have the money in place and the personnel in order to provide the proper staffing and to make the program work so that you don't get halfway in and, and, and run out of funds and dishearten the people that you're trying to work. So the team that I have to execute, Chief Lipscomb, uh, Chief Sawyers, and a host of Nashville Fire Department employees from every walk, from every rank, who is volunteering their time to go into the 12 schools and to provide this um, opportunity for all these uh, uh, students. We've got, we're partner with the school academies and the uh, pencil program, which allow us to go into the 12 schools. Uh, we've got two schools right now that we're using as a, um, as a, um, uh, a beginning process. We're, we're in Maplewood and we're in Hunter's Lane. And right now we have 67 kids in Maplewood and 27 in Hunter's Lane. So we know next year when the school year starts, we're going to be in all 12 schools. We just want to make sure that we have the right personnel, proper personnel to provide what we need to give them. Sustainability, we're going to make sure that we stay with this program, uh, encouraging uh, our, our personnel to um, always do uh, the right thing by uh, being fresh, being uh, innovative, and providing what we know is going to help us uh, make a very diverse department and diverse society. Thank you. So thank you. I know I have a couple of questions. Uh, you were here last year, I think, with something similar. What's different this year than last year? Okay. Well, <clears throat> last year we actually, uh, on the public safety um, aspect, we were asking for a couple of the, uh, uh, positions that um, that was going to help us dealing with more of uh, public safety. This year, we're, we're jumping on board with uh, your program of trying to help the youth, trying to get more diversity and inclusion and, um, in all metro departments. Uh, so again, we're not being selfish with this program, Mayor, because again, we're, we're going to help guide students, not to the Nashville Fire Department, but to, to wherever they, that we feel that they may mostly fit. But we- Isn't that just a mentoring, um, a pro I'm, I'm, yes. let me come back, okay. Mm -hmm. So you, let me ask a couple questions. So you, is there a, a, an actual relationship with Ball State? You mentioned them, mm -hmm. that they have an EMT program. Yes, so is there, tell me what that relationship would be. Well, um, the relationship right now that we have, we have a couple of them with the uh, Pencil Foundation, uh, with I'm the sorry, specifically Ball State. Oh, okay. You said yes, something about Ball State. Well, we met with Ball State and their staff and, and, and the president, and what we did was was try to uh, let them be aware of what program that we were doing. We were going into the high schools, trying to encourage young kids to go ahead and get their uh, EMT by. So, but you, but you actually mentioned that somehow there would be a path for them to Ball State if they were somehow part of a program that yes, you all. Yes, ma'am. So, what, what's what's the guarantee to them to Ball State? What's that relationship? Absolutely. Well, if we're great granted these three positions. What this would do, most kids or most person, anybody, if you go to Vol State and want to be a, a paramedic or EMT, the competition is not just Davidson County, but any county that touched Davidson County who wants to go to that school. So it's so much competition that they get turned away. They don't have enough staff to manage the, the, the supply so and demand. So State is guaranteeing you slots if They're, you have this program. Right. If we have this program, then the kids will not compete against outside entities. If they're in our program, then uh, they'll only be compete, competing against the ones that's in the mentoring program. So it pretty much guarantees them How the opportunity slots? to go to school. How many slots is Ball State going to give us? Um, that will be up to us. If Meaning they're letting us have, once we have our, 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 our staff, our teaching, then it's, our ratio normally is like, you know, a 12 to 1 as far as instructor-student ratio. So, and then we're looking at, morning classes, evening classes, so that number can be pretty high. The, the, the thing that I want you to uh, focus on is that they're saying if we get this program that they're going to allow us to have the students come in and don't compete against anybody else. If they're in our program, then basically it's, it's a matter of number games, but their process of getting into school is a great big, uh, the numbers. I need more information about that, Commander. Okay. So like, I, I think what you need to do is give me some like hard facts on okay. what the relationship would be, like what the guarantee is. I could do that. You, you're talking about this program. What do they get 
from this program? What what? Um, uh, what type of degree or certificate? Is there, yeah, is there a, do, oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. EMT certificate. Yes. Um, well, you can get an EMT certificate. It takes about eight months. Right. So, are, do, well, this is. Are, yes. are you Telling me that these high school students, that the 94 that are in your program, right. are all going to graduate with an EMT certificate. Okay. Well, if um, so, let me back that up. Okay. The um, the program that the 94 that I gave you now, this is in the mentoring process, mentoring uh, program that we have that's locally here at the high schools, but they haven't invested their time to go to college yet. So these students could be 10th grade. 11th or 12th grade. So once they graduate college, that's when the problem happens because once they graduate, let's say they started the program with us and they are, they're, they're gung-ho, they want to become an EMT. They graduate senior, as a senior. And when they graduate, here's the problem. They go to Ball State and they want to enroll as a, uh, to get their EMT, but the competition is so big and they're turned away. So now we have mentored these kids and encouraged them to go to Ball State, but once they get there, because the demand is so heavy, they get turned away if they're in our program if we're granted this then we would have an in-house EMT program that we're able to take the students now that graduate they don't have to go through Ball States I mean they enrolled in Ball State but they don't have to have competition of everybody else so they're pretty much granted uh, opportunity to get taught by our personnel. So are, are you asking for three positions here that will be qualified certif certified instructors that will be able to teach and then award an EMT certificate at completion? Oh uh, yes ma'am. Okay. All right. Tell you. Uh, just a, a couple questions okay. because I think you've got a, a few things going on okay. in here. Uh, one component of it is volunteerism right. within the department and we just heard a little while ago about um, uh, from a PIP where we were trying to encourage, where they were trying to put in an infrastructure to encourage Metro employees to volunteer. Yes. My understanding of that in here is there's no cost for you all to, that has not, for you all to continue these mentoring relationships with the metro schools Absolutely. and for you all to go into those 12 schools, you guys are going to, you, you guys can do that anyway. Is we're that gonna, what I'm hearing? Gonna, regardless gonna go of what happens today, schools? we're going to do that because this is That's something that our uh, Chief White's very proud of and he pushed that uh, with the department. Regardless if we get funded or not, we're going to still be... The funding necessary that you need for that mentoring. That's, and that's right? I just want to be sure. You're going to you're going to pull that off regardless. We're going to mentor regardless. We're just hoping to take it to the level that we need to, to um, once we're pushing mentorship in the high schools, which we're going to do, but if they're interested in to get their EMT, that's where the problems. We, we, we can't do anything okay. about that. Okay, and then my follow-up question has to do with the hiring of the three paramedics to teach the class. Yes. You have people on your staff today that can do that. Yes, we do. So but why do you need why do you need three more to be able to offer the certification option? Because we're to at these max youth? we're at max capacity. We we cannot afford to pull three medics off uh, our, our um, existing department to have them set up to, to, to teach. If you remember one of the slides were about Jerry uh, Swerk, the biggest thing that he talked about was when you have a mentoring program, these people cannot be overloaded. And so my question is, can they volunteer to do that? Well, they could. Good volunteer to do it, but I just don't think that they would be efficient at doing it. Okay. Whoever teaches this program, this is a serious program, and it it, it 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 requires total commitment to the program. And for to ask uh, one of our medics or anyone to have the, the schedule is so demanding, and then to come in to teach. And my fear would be if we start this program, and it's very gated by the state as far as uh, awarding the certificate, because it's very difficult to obtain. It. We want to make sure we, if we start this program and we got a stamp on it that these kids are given the, the best opportunity by the right people to, to achieve success. So, so where are the public schools here? We have the academies. Is this, a, is this through one of the academies? Has that already been established? And the EMT certification, mm -hmm. can you achieve that before you turn 21? Yes. Or does that, so what age do I have to be to be able to get my EMT? Well, you can get that. No, 21 is just to get hired on the department, but uh, you can get your EMT, yes, at 18, yes, you so can I get can EMT. So I can get that as a high 
high school students oh, to become certified. Absolutely. So is this part of the uh, academy model? Um, I know that we have a public, we're working, I know mm -hmm. Michelle and Ashford have worked on a, a public service academy model. Is this part of that? Well, this is uh, uh, the bigger term. Uh, my vision, Mayor, was to begin this, because it's brand new. So next year, what I was hoping to have an academy set up to be like a public service academy. Inside that academy, it would be fire, police, public work, parks, MTA, you know, it would have a whole big facet of the infrastructure and a student will be able to go there to this academy and then pick which one fits them best. But to uh, to format, uh, format a, an academy at a high school, I understand it takes an act of Congress, uh, but uh, we are, they're working very wholeheartedly with us, which we're very appreciative. Again, this is the early stages of it. We're going to, I, I promise you, our charge is to take this young person and give them every opportunity. I hope this, this, this program is funded. Um, I really do. If it's not, we're still going to go out and mentor. We're still going to go into schools and give these, uh, talk to young kids about bettering their self by uh, being productive in, uh, in, in some fashion. So, so I completely applaud all of the goals that I think that you want to do, the mentorship, mm -hmm. the path to a career mm -hmm. through a, an EMT. I, I think that there's some more work that needs to be done here okay. because there's a lot of partners that need to be part of this conversation, not the least of which is MMPS, okay. um, to have the ability, because I, I would see these funded positions as instructors through an academy, which means MMPS has to make sure that they want, that there's that ca capacity. I'm not sure where right now these three people would be located, how they would gain access to schools, um, how they would actually... Yeah. Um, where well, they would be granted the, uh, in, 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 in short, what would happen is, is that they would be attached to our rec recruitment department, the, the three people that we would uh, hope to, um, to hire. And then they would be under the umbrella of the uh, um, um, Ball State, meaning the credentials and everything comes from Ball State. Um, what, what their responsibility would be, just like they're, they're working at Ball State, they would have the same uh, rules, you know, same guidelines. And, uh, so they would no longer be Metro employees, they would be Ball State employees. We're actually funding to hire three Ball State instructors. Is that... What, when, what we're doing? Well, what it would, in short, what it would be is like they're 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 just instructors for Vol State, but no, they would work for the National Fire Department because their responsibilities would not just be with Vol State. It would be you know they still have to be. There's so much work to be done with within this program, getting into those 12 core schools. We we we're, we're going to hit those schools, and it's a lot more detail. But we're going to hit the schools at least 12. Each school will be visited 12 times in the school year. Is that how long it takes to teach? an EMT class? Uh, EMT class is about eight months. So uh, why why 12, why would you go and visit 12 times? I, I, again, I'm trying okay. to make sure I'm understanding. I, I, I think, think there's I'm, a lot going yeah, on I'm here. I'm confusing, yeah, I, think I think you so with, with the, the process. So let me explain. When we talk about going into the high schools, that's the mentoring program. Which you're going to do anyway requires We're going to do no anyway. Funding. But once that kid graduates, then they become, they go into the program that we're going to provide for them as far as getting their EMT. So you want to you want to create your actually your own academy outside of the Metro yes. Public Schools. Okay, I think this needs more conversation because okay. I'm not sure I actually understand. Okay, I'll be more than happy to send you or meet with you, do whatever I need to do to make this more I'm clear. I'm going to have you meet with Brian. Brian's going to help you flesh this oh, awesome. out. Okay. Does anybody else have any more questions? You guys good? Okay. Okay. Right. I applaud your efforts. I, right. I'm, I agree that, that we need more diversity in our, our public uh, safety here in Metro. You actually, the fire department actually has done a really excellent job um, under Chief uh, White um, yeah. bringing in more diversity, but absolutely. The, right. And I love that you guys want to mentor our kids. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We are back with our public investment plans for FY 2018. We now have Nashville made. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we've got Audra Ladd. She's brought a couple folks with her, a couple things with her. Um, we're going to let you introduce the folks with you as appropriate during your presentation. Just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Council Member John Cooper, who's also joined us. I don't think I see any other council members. Um, and uh, also just to remind the viewers at home that we get asked for lots of dollars. These are all very uh, incredibly worthy and creative uh, 
enterprises that uh, people are trying to, to, to bring forward and complex problems that they're trying to solve. However, we won't always have the dollars to fund every uh, every PIP. So we appreciate you guys coming here with your uh, idea. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Audra. Thank you. All right. So we're here today to ask the city to seed fund an organization that supports manufacturing of all sizes in Nashville. And I have with me two folks from the Urban Manufacturing Task Force, which has been meeting for over a year, working on this topic. So I have James Soto, who's the um, founder and CEO of Industrial Strength Marketing, has a Germantown office, and Tom, Tom Harlander, who's the founder of Archiplex, an industrial product design and manufacturing company. Uh, I also brought just a very small sampling of products that are all made here in Nashville. Um, everything from... What's the little, what's the thing down here? Yeah, Tom, you want to talk about I mean, you don't have to talk about it. Just tell me what it is. I don't want to take away your precious time. Just tell that, me what the product is. That is a GoBQ portable barbecue. Cool. A GoBQ. Okay. Yeah. Who knew? So it was basically a product that it weighs less than five pounds, and you put it in your trunk, and you can bring it to barbecue. And, and Archiplex figured out how to design Back to the mic, it. darling. Oh, design and manufacture it. Sorry. That's okay. Um, All right. Oh. And I'm I knocked sorry. something out. You can do this without a... You know, you, you can keep going. Okay. We've got the slides in front of us. I don't, again, Perfect. don't want to take every time. So, um, right now the problem is that manufacturers, the manufacturing community is really fragmented in Nashville. So while it's in a very important industry, there's no, um, there's no community. There's no community built that's connecting makers to larger manufacturers. So we, we have everything from, you know, coffee to, to, to airplane parts to grills to chocolate and really they they have a lot of, of knowledge that they could and should be sharing but there's no entity or mechanism that's allowing that to happen so, oh, so I see some state numbers here I'm just trying to get a sense of when you talk about the community in Nashville I see some Tennessee numbers do you have a, any Davidson County numbers yeah we're gonna get to that in one Great. more okay. one more slide so the solution is a member-based organization replicated off of a national model that the Urban Manufacturing Alliance which is a national organization put forth to build a nonprofit here that um, solves, helps to solve this problem. Basically a unifying body to bring together the interests of manufacturers. And doing that, and doing that um, both with a, with, by creating an organization, but also having a platform where they can use a branding, a, a common branding. So uh, this organization would have a website with the member resources, directory job board, et cetera. So this is where we were going with the impact. So in Davidson County, there are 20,000 people employed in manufacturing jobs. That's a statistic from the state from last year. This doesn't include the artisans and makers. They, they, they're not counted in those state numbers. And my estimation is that there are at least 2,000 of those people. Memphis just did, um, Mayor Strickland just sponsored a study in Memphis that just looked at makers and there are over 500 makers within the city of Memphis. Have we done a study? We have not. Okay. We have not on the makers. Um, instead of a study, this organization would actually track, identify, track um, who they are, where they are, what their employment is, what their revenues are, what they need to grow, and connect them to, say, contract manufacturing. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so advanced manufacturing is also a target industry of the chamber, and the chamber is part of the Urban Manufacturing Task Force. A couple of names that you might recognize uh, that are in Nashville are, are right here. So part of your everyday lives likely impact or likely you participate in, in uh, either as a consumer or you're, you know, you, you maybe even unlikely participate in one of these. Um, in one of these. So a couple other statistics I think is really important. So that 20,000 people is 4.3% of our employment total. If we look at the state as a whole, manufacturing is 11%, 11.1%. So we have a 7% gap in, if we compare our Nashville to the state in terms of manufacturing employment. Um, also, the average job, um, the average hourly wage in manufacturing is $26 here and in the state. Now compare that to uh, a $9.11 of the service industry. So if we could 
take these 650 open positions and fill them with people who are now seeking, you know, industry work in the service industry, we'd have a higher, uh, we'd grow our, our, our manufacturing um, economy more, but also we, we would be providing more income to those families. So it's a huge opportunity. So what the PIP enables is us to, is that this organization to hire a proto CDO, CEO, to really just get the organization off the ground. Um, we've been mentored by the Urban Manufacturing Alliance and by SF Made, who's the premier um, maker of uh, city-based uh, manufacturing initiative in the country, and this is the part of their recommendation. Is this proto CDO, CEO, we get the organization off the ground, we would create the licensing needed for the branding, develop the website, launch the brand, bring on the first members, and raise additional money. And the team, it would be, I'd be participating on the team, um, these, these folks here, and I, also some other members, Chamber, ULI, um, NFA, for Houston, which is our primary maker, banks, uh, First Tennessee has already provided a bit of seed funding to get even to this point. Is this a new, so you're, you're actually starting a new 501c3? Yes. Currently, the Urban Manufacturing Task Force is under fiscal sponsorship from the Arts and Business Council, so it would go from fiscal sponsorship to a new entity that would then uh, be a 501c3. And the timeline is to have the basic assets in place um, by manufacturing day, which is typically in October. The budget, year one total budget is 110. We're asking this, the city to consider funding at 75. The rest would be raised through other partners. Um, we've in interviewed a number of manufacturers along this journey over the year, and they would either be willing to participate with, with a membership fee or otherwise to, to sort of launch this this organization. We really need some seed funding to put all the, the, the pieces in place to show, okay, well, what am, what am I actually benefiting from? What am I getting? Um, and I also think that, that having Metro lead this puts Nashville out there. You know, Na Nashville is pro-manufacturing. We're aggregating all of these businesses. We're showing that from maker all the way to large manufacturer, we are a city we want you to, if you're a manufacturing company, we want you here. And we have something to support you when you're here. ROI. You know, there's, it's hard to value what, when you, when you create something that helps the community come together, there are a lot of benefits. I mean, obviously the skilled labor gap was a couple slides back. That's a, that's a really big one to uh, put a lot of, of um, emphasis on. But the branding platform also has a lot of value, especially for our product companies here that may be deciding, do they stay in Nashville, do they, do they go? We basically attach a, a branding platform to them with resources like a job board, like helping them with space, helping them with understanding contract manufacturing, how to grow and scale. I think that's um, a compelling case for them to stay. And here's just some, some statistics, mostly from um, the National Alliance of Manufacturers. I think the, the most important one is that middle one. For every dollar spent in manufacturing, another $1.81 is added to the economy. So we feel it's a really good investment, and um, we hope that, that Nashville will step up and do this along with all these other cities that are, have already taken this step forward. San Francisco, as I mentioned before, is the premier. Uh, Portland, Chicago, LA, New York City, Cincinnati. There are so what others. are their funding models, Audra? They're very similar to this. Um, New York City did a, a large funding model that was mostly publicly funded. We, we, the, the proposal before you today is the exact model that SF made used to launch. So have some research, ask the San Francisco, the city of San Francisco to come and seed fund, and then after year one, no more, no more public funding, it all comes from other sources. Uh, Cincinnati is focused on batch manufacturing. They have some funding from um, workforce development. Some of the workforce development from the state money comes in. Same thing in Chicago. Portland, uh, there's a little bit of money from the state, but that is more on the maker side. So they, I can give you a matrix of funding models if that would be helpful. Questions? Oh, oh, sorry. No, that's it. That's, yeah. that's it. Let's go to questions. Just because this would be seed money for a new nonprofit, have you researched the laws regarding public 
funding for so I nonprofits? Did. I did. I, because I, there are some challenges there. I did. I asked um, legal counsel about about this, and either we form the 501c3 ahead of time, or we we keep the fiscal sponsorship with ABC, which is a 501c3, and the funding would go to a ABC and then flow through. So either way is you would have to have some type of conduit. Yes, yeah, an why, that why, first but why year. is Metro starting not for profits? Right, but that's another. That's, that's a whole another. That's a whole another question. But I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. there are yes. Um, uh, I'll just so quickly on mm -hmm. the you've got the um, the problem I think that you're articulating. I'm still trying to make sure I understand what it is. Is it about having a common platform for these guys to be? Is it about fragmentation of the industry? Is it about a jobs board? It's it's everything. But you want to you want to mention? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. So um, if you go back to that slide, that'd be great. This one? Oh uh, no, the one you were just on. So um, just very quickly, the main issues were based on the of all the problems and what we looked at were who was it addressing these problems but and we looked at solely the gaps and that what gave the justification of the organization to exist so when we looked at those issues the gaps are the left hand doesn't even More know the, mic. the left hand doesn't even know the right hand exists there's the Tennessee Association uh, Automotive Manufacturer Association the UT Center of Industrial Services the manufacturing extension partnership is here the uh, Tennessee uh, Manufacturing Association runs out of the chamber and, if you and, talk and is there not a another existing organization that could actually be the the catalyst to make, I mean, yeah. one of my biggest yeah. frustrations is that we, we're out there always starting new things when we actually have all these yeah. other things. Well, part of this process was to actually speak to these stakeholders. Okay. And meeting with Paul Jennings, who's an executive director at uh, UT Center for Industrial Services. What yeah. they all really, we all discussed and what the key issue is, whether it's makers and manufacturers, we need to bring the band together. Yeah. To use a Nashville metaphor. And w because there's no uh, self-identification of a community. There's not even a directory of, of manufacturers here to even find each other, whether it's like tier one or suppliers working with each other or, or even just being connected to the products that are being made in Nashville. If, if there's not that even awareness as a community, that's the first that's the first pillar that we, we feel we need to address from a delivery standpoint, other than form the organization. And then from there, as you look at the rest of those issues that were in your deck, um, we, would, we would take a look at those as we can fulfill the promise. So um, it's a problem. The stakeholders that could be brought together are part of this uh, urban manufacturing task force, but we do but needs the person in focus and that first proto CEO and the board to be involved. Our company co-produces ma ma National Manufacturing Day. So how come you guys can't be the organization that does this? <laughs> uh, we're we're a private small business here in town. We're a stakeholder involved in it, and we are already part of it, and okay. we put in nearly a year's worth of work. Okay. Um, but but long story short, we see this issue everywhere, and and what we found is the mo the models of the of the licensed Nashville made SF made are the ones that are actually pulling it off. Okay. Okay. Michael, I know you got a question. Um, then Nancy. So okay. Yes. The, if you wouldn't mind just spending a minute or two, there's a mixture in the presentation and the demo here of local made-in examples. And I'm, I'm very familiar with our maker community that is trying to get off the ground and there's some co-work space forming and all that. But you gave a lot of examples about manufacturing. And I don't think those two self-identify very much together. And I'm not sure they want to self-identify together because the things that seem to take off are local from textile and clothing to food and the things that our tourists and guests find out about and they proliferate around the country. Are you sure you want to mix local maker artisan with manufacturing because they may lose a bit of their identity if they do. And if you do, tell me why you want to mix the yes. two. Yes, I, I, um, the answer is, the, it is a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, we do want to mix them. And there's a couple and of- And they want to be mixed? And they, they do. In the, in the, over okay. the year, we've been speaking with a lot of makers all the way to manufacturers, and there are benefits for both of them to be connected together. The biggest benefit for makers is scalability. So makers do a great job of batch producing, but they do 
they don't know how to lay out a shop floor. They don't know where to do global sourcing. They don't, they don't know what they don't know, right? The manufacturers, even though it's, it seems strange, right? But e the manufacturers, even if they're in a separate, different industry, can pro and are interested in providing the help to help those companies scale. But that sounds like something a trade association would do here. Well, that's. I don't know that. Well, because I mean, in healthcare, that's what we do for the healthcare councils. Yes, but in a trade association, I think that there there are silos that, uh, or I won't call them. Well, there's um, like in 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 this particular industry, we have food and beverage, textile, um, home goods, yeah. advanced manufacturing. There are actually a lot of opportunities for those to cross intersect, and I think with a sure. trade organization, you get them operating within with individuals, but advanced manufacturing concepts that you're using for medical devices actually function in fiber and in, in, in fashion. Yeah. And so I think there's more crossover. I, I, I'm just, I would challenge you to look at the healthcare council because we have hospitals, physicians, ambulatory surgery, x-ray, law, accounting, all there co-helping each other and they pay a member's fee to learn from each other. It's a beautiful model that's self-funded. Just, just something for consideration. Okay. Just a question. Uh, to speak to makers moving into manufacturing. You need uh, that a microphone. So that's really what our organization's been working with and reaching out to local communities, uh, members as well. Uh, we haven't really found that hub uh, and to help bridge the gap between the two. And we found that a lot of the makers in the community are looking to scale and manufacture their products. Uh, that's just a more sustainable model for small businesses. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's more of the trend of where it's going to. Okay. More questions. Can you articulate your mission statement? Is it to bring these people together to learn from each other? Or are there, uh, three or four common issues that you would like to address. Could you? Yeah, I think if I had to do one tagline, it would be to make way for manufacturing in Nashville. So to have a clear channel, a clear resource for if you are make, manufacturing something at any scale, you know that you can come to an organization and find a directory of everyone else who's making it within your sector separate. You can find opportunities to source products, to sell product, and you'd have a and you have a branding platform, the Nashville Made stamp, if you will, on your product that gives your product credibility with a whole, not just consumers, but with your peers. So it's that, it's that, it's that community and that I don't know that the ability to be part of something bigger, but yet you can be at it at any stage. That's the best Thank I can you. do. Can you do better? Can you do that better than me? Than I? You uh, probably can. Yeah, yeah. You got no. time. Good. Great. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. We are back with our public investment plans for FY 2018. We are joined by Laura Moore, uh, which is going to be the early childhood working group and the coordinated pre K enrollment uh, request for the PIP proposal. Want to just to see that you have many folks that you brought with you. Appreciate that as appropriate. Please feel free, free to introduce them throughout your presentation. I uh, want to also just uh, give a shout out. We have a uh, uh, Council Member John Cooper with us today. Also, uh, want to just remind the folks at home that we get asked for many, many dollars to fund many things that are absolutely worthy. We have uh, not as many dollars as we'd like, so we, uh, in advance, appreciate your creativity in trying to be innovative about uh, solving a complex problem. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Laura, for your time. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for allowing us to present to you all today. My name is Laura Moore, and I serve as a Senior Education Advisor for Mayor Barry, and I am presenting this PIP on behalf of a team with representatives from Metro National Public Schools, Metro Action Commission, and the Tennessee Department of Education. The purpose of our PIP is to create a citywide coordinated pre-K enrollment system that will ensure transparency and ease of access to pre-K opportunities for Nashville's families and facilitate collaboration between service providers that will enable them to leverage and streamline the delivery of existing resources to better support families. 
Unlike in the K-12 system, in which MNPS serves 81% of the school age population, the district only serves 36% of the county's four-year-olds in its pre-K programs. Head Start, which is, which is administered by the Metro Action Commission and is the second largest single provider of pre-K, serves an additional 14%. Although they are both Metro agencies, these organizations each have a separate enrollment system with disparate processes from initial outreach and deadlines for application to notice of acceptance. In addition, community providers, who in total serve an additional 31% of the four-year-olds in Nashville, each have their own distinct process. For families, this means they must interface individually with multiple systems with competing processes and deadlines. In some cases, families must accept a seat without having all of the information from the multiple providers to which they have applied to ensure uh, they choose the pre-K program that best meets their needs. In other cases, families hold on to multiple seats across providers until they receive information on all of their options, making seats unavailable in time for other families who would benefit from access to pre-K. These same factors make resource management difficult for providers by slowing their process to accommodate all of the applications they receive and address applications from their wait list. Our proposed solution to this problem is to create a coordinated enrollment system that would allow families to apply to pre-K seats across providers, beginning with MNPS and Head Start, simultaneously. The system will include information about programs such as location, hours, availability of before and after care, and other comprehensive services, and income eligibility requirements so that families can make informed decisions about pre-K programs that best meet the needs of their children. The system will also have a back end that tracks enrollment, transfers, wait lists, and vacancies that will enable the city to be even more responsive to families. There are currently 4,765 students who access pre-K through MNPS and Head Start. A coordinated enrollment system would allow these families easier access to pre-K. As the system expands to incorporate private partners, it will benefit an additional 2,500 families and potentially create an avenue for some of the additional 1,800 families who are not currently enrolled in pre-K to access these programs as well. Additionally, mobile families would be a market that would especially benefit from a coordinated enrollment system by limiting the difficulty and wait time of transferring to another pre-K program. For the 2015-16 school year, MNPS had a 32% mobility rate among its students, meaning that nearly one-third of their students ended the school year at a different school from which they began. Head Start had a mobility rate of 34%. Schools that serve high populations of low-income families have even higher mobility rates, and research shows that low-income students are most likely to benefit from access to high-quality pre-K, showing larger gains and gains that sustain over time compared to their higher-income peers. Having a system that can more easily meet their needs would have a positive impact on these families and their students. Another market for the solution would be agencies and other nonprofits that work with families who serve young children to help connect them with needed services. Having access to a system that shows where students are enrolling and includes information on their academic and non-academic needs would help ensure that community resources that are important for students and families to thrive beyond access to high quality pre-K during the traditional school day would help facilitate those partnerships. As mentioned, as mentioned earlier, providers, first MNPS and Head Start, and later other community providers would be a market for this solution as it would be a tool to help them better plan and manage their resources to best meet the needs of their students and families. Our initial research into other communities like New Orleans and New York City who have coordinated their pre-K enrollment systems has shown the importance of taking the necessary time to understand the complexity of current, and, uh, current processes to mitigate the potential for unintended consequences that might negatively impact providers or families. Therefore, we plan for our work to unfold across three phases. The first phase will be focused on a facilitated, collaborative, in-depth discovery and planning process that will allow us to identify the existing resources and processes, overlaps and commonalities, and gather feedback from families on the major components of the enrollment systems. 
uh, including the application process, parent acceptance process, process for tracking and filling vacancies, communication of options, and recruiting and marketing. During this phase, we will also begin work on items that can be coordinated in the immediate term, including creating a central program inventory and requirement listing for parents that is centrally located, um, coordinating efforts to communicate options to families, and comparing wait lists. The second phase will be focused on a build out of a public facing portal that will serve as a platform for a common application process across MNPS and Head Start and connect to a back end system that allows for common tracking of vacancies. This phase will also focus on implementing the strategies from the phase one discovery process to more formally coordinate the enrollment process across MNPS and Head Start. The third phase will focus on bringing on additional pre K partners outside of Metro. Our request is distributed across two years. In year one, we are requesting resources to support the hiring of a facilitator and project manager to support the work of our team to conduct the in-depth discovery process. These roles will be crucial to documenting what we find throughout that process, ensuring we stay on schedule, and helping move the group toward consensus. We are also requesting resources for costs that will be incurred as we begin to build out the public-facing portal and begin work on those items that can be coordinated in the near term. In year two, we anticipate increased costs to continue the build out of the public facing portal, as well as implement the additional staffing and resources needed to manage the new coordinated system. The discovery process in year one will help us refine our year two estimate, and we will actively pursue opportunities for in-kind support through MMPS, Head Start, and broader Metro government through its open data resources, in addition to resources from non-Metro avenues. Uh, we are confident that our financial request will produce benefits that far exceed the costs. Research shows that having access to affordable childcare is correlated with increases in the number of hours worked, duration of employment, and increased earning of working mothers. In turn, parental workforce participation and productivity have been linked to improvements in child well-being, increased family economic security, and a more productive economy. Additionally, if you look at our handout, your handout, uh, you'll see that in an analysis that our team conducted using student outcome data from the district and national economic impact studies, Metro would realize more than $2 million each year in student and societal benefits that would occur from positive impacts on kindergarten readiness, early literacy, special education services needed, and chronic absenteeism, as well as the value added through the social and emotional development of each student. Lastly, a coordinated enrollment system will increase the ability for MMPS and Head Start to be competitive for and attractive to national sources of funding that are drawn to communities that coordinate service delivery across providers to better serve families. We will measure our success by the decrease in time taken to fill pre-K vacancies, the increase in the number of students who are continuously enrolled in pre-K throughout the year, the number of families with access to wraparound services, and the increase in the number of students who are ready for kindergarten at the end of pre-K. Our team is composed of experts from MMPS, Head Start, and the Tennessee Department of Education who have experience in managing the current enrollment processes for the city. Our ability to bring on a skilled facilitator and project manager will help ensure that our work runs on time and within budget. Um, and this process will also have consistent oversight from the Nashville Early Childhood Education Working Group, which is composed of high-level representatives from the district, Metro Action Commission, Tennessee Department of Education, Tennessee Department of Human Services, Tennessee Early Childhood Training Alliance, Vanderbilt, United Way, the National Public Education Foundation, and the Mayor's Office. Um, this slide highlights the members of our team across those entities. In addition to funding, the identification of a skilled facilitator and project manager will be crucial to a successful launch of our project. We have already identified potential partners to fill this role, and our goal is to launch in late spring slash summer of this year. As mentioned earlier, during year one, we'll actively explore opportunities for in-kind resources through our partners, as well as, um, as well as while we complete the discovery process. Additionally, because this group has been convened by the National Education Childhood Working Group, we believe we will have access to additional non metro uh, sources of revenue within Nashville, as well as from national partners who have already expressed an interest in the collective work that Nashville is engaging in as part of the larger initiative to increase access to high-quality pre-K. We are happy to take questions. <coughs>
I've got a couple, but go ahead, Nancy. So, <clears throat> explain to me, for year one, you're looking for uh, $100,000 for a facilitator and a project manager. So really, that's what we're looking at funding today. Yes, yes. Not the total amount. That's right. Um, we think that that discovery process will be really important to helping us see where we can coordinate the two systems where we might need to um, come up with creative solutions. Um, and so we want to spend this first year doing that discovery process so we can be good stewards of taxpayer dollars if we are lucky enough to be funded. Where are you going to put this, these positions? Where are they going to be housed? I think that is another good question that we will address throughout the discovery process. Um, well, I but assume you, but the discovery process, you need the positions. So where do you want the position for the, right? Gotcha. Um, for those positions, um, we imagine that it'll continue to be kind of housed in that National Early Childhood Education Working Group, which is housed out of our office, um, but that they would obviously work very closely with all of our partners from the district and Head Start. So we'd be we'd be creating two new positions in the mayor's office, is that the recommendation? These would not be full-time positions, they would be people that we would hire on a contract basis. Okay. That's, and then is there a cost savings opportunity because you're running right now multiple systems, so by bringing these systems together, what's the cost savings? Uh, we do not have that figure, and that's something that we have talked about as a team. Um, we do anticipate that as the systems are brought together that there might be additional families that are currently accessing pre-K who would be involved, um, and so that you know we may have to have additional resources to um, address increased numbers of families who are accessing pre-K. Um, so we're, so we're we, we know we don't have enough pre-K seats as it is. So go back to that very first slide. Mm -hmm. So this coordinated system is gonna, uh, I wanna make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. So if there's an opportunity to, that, I'm sorry, that not that one, the go back, yeah, that one. Okay. So you've got, that's the market. Right now we've got, 3,400 and then 1,300. Mm -hmm. If we add more kids, we don't actually have the seats to put them in. Right, so that's outside of the scope of this project, but one thing that we did highlight in our proposal is that, um, you know, because there's many factors, but one of the factors of having an inefficient enrollment process is that there are cases where we have seats that families could access, but because of all those shifting dynamics with, Got you know, it. families figuring out all their options, we do have seats that are not able yeah. to be filled that's that exist already. something number you had in there? Yes, that's like 219 number. And 19 that are actually empty, but right. because of all the, mm -hmm. the jockeying, they, they went empty to the last minute and then no one can fill them. Right. So and and then the hub process that we've been talking about, which is this coordinated point of contact for government interface, how might hub be a mechanism to create the, the entry common entry point for this, or is that something you guys have thought about? Um, we have not had those conversations, but we definitely are open to you um, learning more about how that system will work as it is built out and seeing if there are opportunities for us to, to leverage those resources. Because I, and I don't see any IT cost on here, so am I missing that? Is that, Am I missing an IT cost for what the platform is going to be? Yeah, I, I, I think for us, we know there's a lot of questions that we have to get answers to, which is why we want to spend the year really digging into that. Um, so I wouldn't be able to estimate how much that portal might cost at this point. Um, it's one of the things we hope to, one of the things that we will learn through the discovery process. Got it. So, mm -hmm. so as Nancy said, the real request is just, the hundred thousand dollars. That's right. To start the planning process for the coordinated entry system. Okay. That's right. right. We just wanted to give you a sense of what the whole ask I might be. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. The, the future impact uh, mm -hmm. would in this year one you be talking to these uh, uh, private folks about being part of this, and is that a voluntary participation? How what, how do you envision that part of this first year discovery would happen? 
Um, so for part um, of year one, we're really talking about just focusing on our public providers first and talking to the families that are accessing the systems we have in place that are operated by Metro. Um, we do anticipate that we'll begin some conversations with private providers. Um, as a part of our larger pre-K work, we've engaged some of them to talk about what quality looks like and how we might engage them, um, but don't think that will be a huge focus of year one. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. I would just like Laura to walk through the uh, cost-benefit analysis line by line. <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> you might I be kidding, but I actually am uh, happy to walk through this. Yeah. The mayor okay. said I was being facetious. I don't. Okay. I don't know what that means, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm sure <laughs> I am. But I'm sure I am. <laughs> no, gotcha. Take a um, yeah. So just in terms of um, the number of students we're looking at, again, this is the uh, the number of students who applied for pre-K with the district who. Could could have had access to a seat on day one, but um, were not able to be served. And so what we did is we identified, um, you know, a few different areas that the district does track that we could, you know, assess what the impact was um, of students attending pre-K on those different outcomes. So we worked very closely with the school district on that. Um, the research and assessment folks provided that information to us over the summer. Um, and so we followed, I think, three or four students for three or four years to assess the impact that students participated in the district's pre-K versus the students who didn't had on these outcomes. Um, and so the impact figures you see down the side is the average impact um, looking at those students. And then in terms of the cost savings, we did pull those from last year's budget for the school district. Um, and then for the economic impact information, uh, did pull in estimates from national studies. Um, so looking at you know Chicago and Detroit um, as a couple of examples in New York and Michigan. Um, so just to pull out one example on kindergarten readiness, that average impact was 9%. Um, so that cohort, you know, 9 additional percent of those students were kindergarten ready. Um, and so that correlates to 19.71 kids. And then the savings, the 2,170 pulled in from a national estimate and average of several studies. So we did that throughout. Um, and then the social benefits at the bottom uh, is looking at an economic impact study out of Columbia University um, that showed that impact as high as $7,500 for each child. And Laura, I'm just gonna, I know we're getting ready to be close, so I wanna make sure, does anybody else have any other questions? Oops. This is just a statement more than anything. <clears throat> it appears based on your timeline mm -hmm. that it's gonna take, it'll be two years before you would actually see a portal in place. So when I see a $2 million number here and two years go by, I, yeah. I ask you the question about what's the sense of urgency here? And it seems that this could move quicker. So that's just, um, okay. that seems awfully slow to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's something we want to balance is, you know, taking the time to do the work right on the front end. Um, since we are dealing with young lives, wanting to make sure that when we get something in place that it's the right system that works for students and families and also works for providers. Um, so we will do our best to move quickly through that process, but do really value the time that we need to dig into those different components. Well, and, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, to Talia's point, I mean, I think that the point is to create the interface so that, that we're not leaving 219 seats. <laughs> <laughs> empty um, and how can we do that I mean maybe that's a separate piece that, that we're working on in tandem so that, that you can take the time you need to make sure that you're doing this interface right I mean most colleges have gone to that idea of a common app this is not something that I think that's that's hard to do um, and then how, how guarantee is that the that, that the seats are not going to be empty while we're in process, um, but I also know that this is also critical for us on data going forward to be able to capture so for some of those funders that you uh, talked about so that we can add more seats. That's that's also the opportunity. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that part of the reason that we are looking at this timeline, and, and I agree with Laura, we can look to speed it up, is that when we looked at other people who had implemented this, because the Head Start requirements are so detailed and specific, the 
program in New Orleans, for example, uh, did not do the process that they needed to. Head Start, as a result, was in violation of its federal requirements, meaning it was not full on day one. So part of the process for us in wanting to make sure we have somebody who's looking at this with us is that we don't end up jeopardizing funding for any of the sources. So I, I know that we can move forward to Talia's point quicker, but we are also very nervous about uh, not somehow meeting a federal requirement and jeopardizing the funding that we already have for our programs. Yeah, I'm totally sympathetic to that. I think that we should absolutely make making sure that this is going well. I also worry about the 438 kids that over two years are going to be missed. So we need to work on that too. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think that's all we've got. That's all the time we've got actually. So thank you guys. Appreciate you. Okay, thank you. We are back with our public investment plan FY 2018. We are joined by Renee Pratt and a whole bunch of folks that she has brought with her. I will let you introduce them throughout your presentation as appropriate. Uh, this is to expand shower access and, uh, and assess need for public restrooms for the homeless. Uh, we also have Council Member Berkeley Allen and Council Member John Cooper behind us. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, as we often uh, like to remind the viewers at home, uh, we get asked for lots of dollars. We cannot fund every request, but we appreciate your time and attention to taking a complex issue and coming up with a creative solution. So, Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I'm Renee Pratt, Executive Director of Metro Social Service, and I'll introduce my guest at the end. This proposal would provide a mobile shower on a rotating schedule for people who are homeless and have no other place to bathe. It would also assess the need for additional public restrooms in the downtown area. On any given night, there are about 23 homeless individuals in our city. About 700 of those individuals reside outside. The homeless population reports there are limited access to showers. Along with the need for showering, this initiative would document whether or not there are adequate public bathrooms in the downtown area. For showers, it is known that people who do not bathe for a length of time can experience a variety of health problems. Bacteria can flourish, creating pathogens that are first on the skin and then if transferred to the eyes, nose, and mouth, they enter the body. Our solution is to partner with Shower Up, a nonprofit organization that provides a mobile shower unit. We will park this unit near frequently used public bathrooms and buildings on a scheduled basis. Shower Up will provide a hot shower, towels, and toiletries. The mobile unit will be located in places convenient to the homeless. Other services could be provided on site, and an attendant would be on duty during the hours of operation. Surveys would be conducted at that time to determine if there are adequate public restrooms in the downtown area. If the assessment identifies the need for expansion, the proposal would identify a mobile toilet shower combination unit. And this will be expanded and used throughout the city. This will be based on the model out of a fresh up Palm Beach. When the main library and the bus center is open, many homeless people use the restroom facilities there to bathe and this creates a maintenance problem. Those who are staying in homeless shelters can use those restrooms and showers during the hours they are open for people to do so. They often allow people to come in after hours and on request. However, if every homeless person wanted to shower, they would not have the combined capacity to provide enough showers. Phoenix, Arizona, Reading, Pennsylvania, Palm Beach, and several other cities operate public and mobile showers. Many cities also identified the lack of public bathrooms as a major concern because of the human waste. The total expenditures for this project is $225,000. Personnel cost is for three attendants for the mobile unit. Two would be on site and we'd have a backup if necessary. The proposed impact is for the homeless community to have access to showers improves their health and their dignity. It will also improve their quality of life. 
By offering resource and referral information for the homeless, this could drastically improve their way of life to the end goal of housing. Hopefully year one will help us establish the baseline data needed to assess the impact on the homeless community. Metro Social Services will lead this initiative along with the assistance of the Homelessness Commission, Metro Water, the Public Library, and the nonprofit Shower Up. Once we've ex executed agreements, within six weeks after funding, we'll begin the mobile shower unit. We will also collect surveys at that time, and we will evaluate our baseline data on a quarterly basis. Once we analyze the data, next year's request may include a proposal for a combination shower toilet mobile unit, and this will increase possibly the use of public bathrooms in the downtown area, but we will also look at the option to include them as well. For these concepts to sustain, we must pursue grant opportunities, nonprofits, the Community Enhancement Fund, and Metro government funding to help us sustain. That concludes my presentation, and with that, I'd like to say thank you to Liz Coleman with the library, Sonia Allman with Water Services, Paul and Rhonda Schmidt with Shower Up, G. Tackett with the Homelessness Commission, and Dinah Gregory with Social Services. Thank you. Thank you. Renee, I appreciate it. I've got a couple questions, and then uh, some other folks may as well. Um, so uh, with the, with, go back to the statistics. I know that we think that there's about 2,300 folks on our streets um, at any one night who are, are, right. are 2,300 who are unhoused. But we've got, they do have access to, next, next one, the one before that. Yeah, so you've got some places where people can go yes. right now. Mm -hmm. You've got the, how, how many are the, Room at the end, how Room many? Room and, and, uh, and the mission yeah, provides the mission. showers for the city as well. So um, the statistics we have is they probably provide about 30,000 showers a year. And so what's the gap? How, how many? The gap do we is need? those showers are accessible to the people that stay in the mission. For the people that live outside, they don't have, they cannot go to the mission and have a shower. Have we talked to the mission about asking we, them to ha allow access just for showers? No, we didn't at that point. We brought them together just to talk about the issue of showering and determine if there was a need for additional showers in the city. Okay. But that could be a possibility. Again, it has to, um, we'd have to look at the hours the showers would be available, the time they're open, and many people just choose to stay outside. No, I, I, I get that, but yeah. I, again, if we're creating a place to, to go for a shower, I didn't know if there was already a partner that had shower facilities that would be willing. Let, let me ask a couple of questions about what we're actually funding. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're, um, you mentioned that we would be in partnership um, with Shower, the, um, Shower Up, and mm -hmm. it looks like we are actually proposing to purchase the, the unit, the toiletries, and the personnel. So explain to me what the partnership is. How the partnership we aren't just is it? they provide the actual mobile unit for our use. Okay, so. And that would be, and to, the upkeep and to provide for the unit to be in use is about 50,000 per year, I think. Um, but they're asking for us to pay for the $50,000 for the unit. So why why do we need a not-for-profit to run this if we're gonna provide everything to do it? I'm just trying to understand what the benefit is. Yeah, to have our own unit, it would cost a lot more than just the $50,000. How much more? Uh, one unit is about $100,000. Okay, so mm -hmm. if one unit is $100,000, then we've got to pay them 50000 a year to rent it? And that's just the base unit. That doesn't include maintenance of the facility, the toiletries, any of those supplies. No, because we're, we're paying we're for paying those, We're paying for too. that as well, right. Are we, are, so it, are they paying for maintenance? Are they paying for gas? Are they paying to to move this thing around? I mean, what's what's the partnership piece? That's, that's what I'm trying to understand. Paul, would you like to? Paul. Okay. Yeah. Paul, with shower up. So, great question. Um, what we're doing right now is uh, really establishing the, the prototype unit. We see that in Nashville we're going to need more of these, obviously. And so, what this does for us then is allows us to have the unit on the street, able to use it. That portion of the, uh, of the cost 
covers really just for us to operate for the year um, for the for the times that we're going to be partnering together. So that is. Are you going to use this unit for other times that will not be with Metro? Well, we're going to we're going to use it as much as we can. So right now, I think the agreement is for 36 hours a week. So if we can find volunteers, if we can find staff to do more than that as the need arises, we'll, we'll happily do that. So, so our rental, so again, going back, what we're basically doing is we're renting a unit from you at $50,000 a year that gives us access for 36 hours a week. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That, thank you. I, that, that's helpful. And it doesn't only have one shower, it has three showers. Okay. Uh, Talia. What other options are there? Um, if this, if, you know. At this point, um, we're looking at those options as well. Um, as the mayor mentioned, there are other um, providers here in the city that offer showers, so we will take back the possibility of looking at, looking at extending their hours, looking at how we can partner with them to um, open up to showers for people just not staying there. So we'll look at that option as well. Um, at this point, the other option I would think that would exist is to look at other concepts here in the city and see what's available or could become available in terms of locations where people can shower. At this point, those are the only two locations for the homeless. So, and then the other option would be after we establish the baseline data is to purchase our own unit. Um, you can look at a combination bathroom shower that's around $100,000 as well. And if it works, if it grows, then the possibility exists that we might look at that data and determine if bath additional bathrooms are needed, if additional showers are used, then we could look at the possibility of purchasing our own unit. Are, are there other models of, out there that are not just showers but are also toilets? So yes. You could have a comp so why would we not actually have a unit that is a shower and a toilet? We have when we pull together our community partners, excuse me. For oh, that. sure, no, go right ahead. When we pull together our community partners, we initially thought that bathrooms were an issue here in the city and the needs for bathrooms for the homeless existed. We found that that wasn't the case. And we did not have any baseline data to tell us if the need existed or not. There is no one department in Metro that's responsible to provide this information around human waste. So we thought before we make that recommendation, of saying why not do a combination unit, we would start with the shower up concept, do the surveys, determine if additional bathrooms are needed, and then look at a mobile unit, a combination unit next year. And then on the personnel cost, who, who would employ the personnel? Who? The Homelessness Commission and Social Services. Okay, so they would and be Metro employees. They would be, and yes, and we plan on using formerly homeless individuals to fill those positions. So, and, and those folks would work, you would need three people to run it? We would need two people to run it, one is a backup, we'd look at one female attendant, one male attendant. Okay, but you'd only have three, so what happens when? One female, one male, I'm only getting three people. We'd rotate them, and if the, if the need existed, we use volunteers, but we would rotate the people. They would only be working 36 hours per week. Right, and then you had mentioned, I think Shower Up had mentioned that you guys have, are gonna use this model other places. But we probably wouldn't be responsible to no, pay Right, for no, it, and yeah. you were gonna staff it with volunteers. Mm -hmm. What's the capacity for the unit um, on how many hours it can actually function in a week? Right now we're looking at about uh, 50 hours a week. Depends on, we run on propane, so everything that we do is just propane operated. So we could do 50 hours a week, we could do every single day for 10 hours if we had the, uh, the people that wanted to do it and volunteer and, and that sort of thing. Okay, I'm just trying to get an idea of what a unit, what the capacity for a mm. unit is, and so what we're, what, what the gap is. So like if we're going to use it 36 hours, are you guys going to go and use it another 36 hours or? That's a question mark we do. Uh, that, that's a question mark we don't know yet. It's going to be based on the volunteers that are, and the need that's there as well. Um, so it may be another 20 hours, it may be, you know, another 36 hours, which that's a lot of showers. Well, that's why I'm trying to, again, understand, how, you know, what is... 
uh, is, uh, you, you said the word a minute ago, prototype, which tells me that you guys have not done this before. Right, that's correct. We are, we are just, we're launching um, in about four weeks and the truck is right now in, in retrofitting stage. So when it's, when it's operational, uh, we're ready to roll. What happens if this is not something that we end up going with? What is your plan for this unit? We're going to use it as we have volunteers and as we have opportunity. Uh, having the partnership with, uh, with the city of Nashville allows us a faster ramp up, allows us to serve more people more quickly. Okay. I, I have a question. It's a hard question to ask, but I'm going to ask it. Um, in terms of these other cities that have similar programs, mm -hmm. have there been any, any identified public safety risk? I'm just I'm trying to figure out in my mind where people are changing, where they're changing. Well, no, just where they're changing clothes. You know, you've got men and women, and yeah, we'll talk about how, how is that piece of it mm -hmm. addressed? Uh, uh, your stuff, like yes, your that's a yeah. very good question. Yeah. Um, and right now the only two cities that we know of that have anything like this are St. Louis. They've just really this a nonprofit launched there uh, last May. Uh, so we don't have much data from them on that. And then there's a, uh, a community in California that has done it with buses and I don't even know how long they've been operating. So really this is this is a fairly new concept. And so these public shower cities that are in the presentation then those those are not these mobile units. These no, are these are two these are mobile units, correct. Yeah, in, so in St. Louis. I see Phoenix, right. Redding, Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Seattle, Atlanta, yeah. Minnesota. We did try to find some data and see if they had collected any information that we could possibly use in terms of how it works. It was very limited. Um, it's still, the concepts are fairly new, so it really hasn't been tested long enough to determine how effective it is and how it works. I think the uh, mobile showers are private. That's why we're saying that you have to have a male-female attendant. So that way, that you know, one side is male, the other side is female, and they would make strong protocols in place yeah, to would. Yeah, kind and, of manage and people we also, coming and going. We also met with the Metro Police officers to determine not to harass people, but to say if we have the units parked in certain locations around the city, if we could have more people to patrol there and kind of help us with people moving along, and they said they would help as much as they could. So I'm interested in this as a, a pilot, just because, but I'm trying to get my arms around the fact that if you actually need $225,000 today, you guys are building out the unit, the not-for-profit's taking care of that, that's going to exist, you're going to get the water for potentially some arrangement that we're going to have with the city, so it's not going to cost you anything. Well, it, it, it will be a cost of the water. Um, so that we yeah, can figure that the, piece right. out potentially as a right. partnership. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, you know, again, trying, trying to figure out like what the real cost could be to say, let's try this um, without hiring three people, but to try it first with a pilot with your organization mm -hmm. to see if, how it works, because um, I'm, I'm not con I'm not sure we thought through all the pieces yet, I'm, and so I'm not sure what the data looks like as far as what some of the things that you're asking. Yeah. Um, so if that was the case, what would it really take for us to make this happen? And we can go back and look at the concept is, of course, we this would be our first year. We wanted to establish baseline data so we'd know specifically what works, where is the demand, if there is a demand. And of course, we don't necessarily have to hire three personnel done at this time starting right out. You know, it just depends on if we roll it out slowly and look at a few hours a week around locations like the library where homeless are, around MTA where homeless frequent. Then I've got an idea for some place to put it. Yeah, I just, I, right. I, what I want is, is, is I think that the shower up folks to say, hey, look, this is a new concept. We're going to retrofit this. We've got the capacity to do this. We're going to find a way to connect with water so that we can lessen that. We're going to work with some formerly homeless folks who can be part of our 
kind of process here with volunteers from Shower Up as we roll this out. We're going to go out and get some of those toiletries and towels donated and for six months this will cost us X. I, I think that's that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm looking for here. Okay. Because I, I want us to do this. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that 225000 bucks right out of the box is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So what I need is your help to help me actually get that framed in a way that um, gets it to a place where we can actually do this. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Nancy? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Answer. I think we're good. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Appreciate you. We are back with our final, I think, presentation. Brian, is that correct? Uh, with the public investment plan for FY 2018, we will hear in a minute from the Art in Private Development uh, portal, and Jen uh, Cole is going to walk us through that. Uh, because this is our last PIP of the day, I just want to say once again thank you to the EC for giving us this space. I want to really give a shout out to Brian Kelsey, who made all of this happen with uh, the excellent preparation that I know he walked through each of these teams. I want to also thank my fellow uh, panelists up here, Talia, Nancy, and Rich. Michael uh, Burcham has been with us the whole time as well. Uh, give a shout out to the council members who attended. We still have John Cooper with us today and Berkeley Allen. want to especially thank our uh, Metro IT folks for uh, live streaming this and making sure that these would be uh, available later for anybody who wants to, to watch it. Riveting, riveting, riveting. Um, um, all right, you guys are awesome. You guys are our last ones. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jen. I know you brought up several folks with you that you are welcome to introduce as appropriate during your presentation. And once again, I'll turn it over to you. Panel. I know this has been a long couple of days and um, we're excited to do this. Um, today um, we want to talk with you about a public-private alliance that will increase the amount and quality of public art in the city of Nashville. Um, and that is part of a team, um, and I'm going to introduce them. Caroline Vincent, who runs the public art program here in Nashville, um, Bob Lehman from the planning department, Bill Herbert, our zoning administrator, Marty Sewell from the planning department, and Gary Gaston from the Civic Design Center. Um, our other stated partner, the Urban Land Institute, was unable to join us today. Um, because of a conflict. Um, we know that public art has a positive benefit on all kinds of communities. Studies from Princeton, the National Endowment, the Wallace Foundation tell us over and over and over that the presence of public art increases social connectivity, community pride, and increases um, the opportunity for economic investment in neighborhoods. We know that now cares about this. We've seen recently with the I Believe in Nashville mural vandalism issue on 12 South, how quickly the community rallied around that idea of an artist and a private developer and a mural as part of a community. Um, we have a nationally recognized public art program. Um, in this community um, that thanks to the council um, and the community um, has consistently for the last 15 years put high quality public art into the public realm in Nashville. But we are limited in that program in putting art only on public property. Our recently uh, completed public art community-wide plan indicates that there's a significant amount of property in this county that Metro Arts through the public art program will actually never be able to facilitate public art on and in. And it calls for us to sort of do more to incent the private sector to include art in the, pri in the private space for neighborhood associations, for private individuals, and for um, uh, developers. And this proposal seeks to do that. This, through a public-private alliance and an online portal, seeks to sort of help raise the bar of art in the private space. So. One of the things I'm really proud of is that Caroline and our team in the public art works consistently well with all of our metro partners to execute public art on public property. We know how to do it. We know the processes. We know the, the national um, quality standards that are, are adhered to, and we, we have guidelines that um, the city has helped us develop. But if you're a private developer, you have none of that. So this is Tarek. He's a, a private developer here in Nashville. He has three mixed-use projects happening in different areas of the county, and he's talked to his friends and other communities who have integrated public art into their developments. He knows it increases value. He knows it creates wayfinding opportunities. He knows it creates a sense of common space in the development. He really wants to do something, but he literally doesn't know where to start. He has all, he is filled with questions. How much does it cost? What does an artist's contract look like? How would I find somebody? Do I need a permit? What kind of permit? What department do I start with? And by the time he asks all these questions, nine times out of 10, there are so many questions that he just stops and says, you know what? It's not worth my time. I'm gonna walk away. 
Um, we seek to change that framework um, through uh, an art and private development portal. This portal will be hosted on Nashville.gov. It will be completely web-based and it will do four important things. Um, one, right now it will help us clarify metro policies related to art and private development. Uh, my dear friend Bill and I frequently talk when someone wants to do a mural in the city of Nashville, they just start playing the game of phone tag. Who, who can I get? What metro city employee can I get who might answer my question about can I put a mural? What needs, does a mural need to look like? Do I need a permit? And sometimes they, you know, depending on if they go to the water department or some other department, they might get a whole other different set of answers. Um, we have a very good set of working relationships on codifying this on the back end, but we manage almost every inquiry from the general public as a one-off, taking an incredible amount of staff time to, to figure this out. And in some instances, we don't have terribly clear policies. Um, for example, if someone wanted to put an artist-designed bike rack in an adjacent sidewalk easement, how would they go about doing that? Would they start at Public Works? Would they start with us? Would it Move, where would it go? And it's very unclear to the general public about how they might for, do that. So we would first and foremost clarify metro policies and make them easy to understand for the general public through infographics and other, other things. We would create an online and interactive developer guidebook. Often developers start with what's easy, which is often murals, but there are a plethora of things developers can and should do related to art. Everything from purchasing art, objects from local artists, to integrating seating, lighting, infrastructure elements, signage, etc. A developer guidebook would give guidance for that, would show people sample budgets, sample processes, etc., and make it easy for them to understand the suite of possibilities that are open to them. Um, the third and possibly the anchor of this is that it would increase our ability to identify local hire. Um, the mayor has made it a cornerstone of her administration to increase local employment and particularly look at the creative sector. Um, the portal would include lists of vetted artists who had past experience doing this type of project. Just like you wouldn't hire someone to build your house who had never built a house, we probably don't want developers hiring artists who've never done projects like this before. We know who those are, we are continually developing those, those artists, and we'd be able to put their CVs and backgrounds of people who've done past projects, making it a connection point between supply and demand in the developer community. The other thing that we would do is public art is not just about the artist, it's also about subcontractors and fabricators. So through the last 15 years of the public art program, we've developed a really wide network of local subcontractors from cement to landscaping to metal fabrication, all of whom are not directly art producers but are working indirectly with artists, and this would continue to bump up our ability to sort of put forward qualified lists of local hire. And the last is we would have a dedicated mural assistance center. 90% of the questions many of us get are around the mural question, making it easy to understand from soup to nuts how to plan, execute, and develop appropriately and with the appropriate metro approvals any types of mural on private property. So. I, under, I think I know the question you're going to ask, which is why would we spend public money on this thing that really is about the private sector? And the answer is that it's good for business. Last year, Metro issued $3.9 billion worth of permits for non-residential construction in more than 12,500 um, distinct separate projects. And there are more than 56,000 working artists in Nashville, many of whom earn their living freelancing from project to project. So we have a supply and a demand. We have a significant number of developers putting forward and building new things. If just 10% of those developers opted in to opt in and integrate public art into their projects, we'd have more than 1,200 paying jobs for local artists and more than 1,200 newly initiated pieces of art in the public sphere. That's a level of scaling that we will never be able to do with the 1% program um, in terms of art in the public realm and in terms of high quality, high paying jobs for the sector. And we know developers are already doing this. Design Center, Urban Land Institute, um, we are working all the time with developers who have a high capacity and desire to do this, but simply lack information, technical assistance, and resources. We also know it's good for neighborhoods. Um, we've been working for the last year with um, East Area Business, um, East Area Chamber, as well as um, Historic Germantown Neighborhood Association, both of whom, have, from the neighborhood side, have used art and mural 
murals to really facilitate neighborhood wayfinding and quality and pride. In fact, Germantown has gone so far as to put in their Germantown, their neighborhood association charter, uh, a desire for all new developers who come into the community to actually integrate and add public art. And they're working hand in hand with developers to help them do this. We know that the easier it is for neighborhood associations to do this work, the more neighborhood associations that are less resourced and outside of the urban core will take this on. And we want all neighborhoods have to have the same access to quality and information to do this and scale this in their own communities. This is how we'll get there. Um, first, we'll convene an existing work group that already exists informally and formalize it, um, including these partners, um, as well as neighborhood association leaders um, and artists, um, to really identify what the key core issues are. We will hire a project manager. We are unable with our 1% funds to use our staff resources on a non-percent project, um, so we need to hire an external partner um, to, to do this work and to herd our cats. Um, we will clarify during that work group process as any metro policies that need to be clarified or codified um, and do the required metro approvals. Um, if we can do all of that, we expect a 12-month lead time um, where we would then be able to launch a beta version of this site including all of these components, and then for about six months after that, continue to, to clarify the content and content release. Um, once that 12 to 18 month period was over, we believe Metro Arts can manage with our existing um, budget and staff resources, updates, and content management. It's just this initial lift up and push out that we really need. This is the business framework. We, all, we believe fundamentally there is a, uh, there's a, a a supply demand, and this will close this supply demand. $40,000 for project management, $5,000 for artist training to make sure artists have the same set of information, $10,000 for design, and $2,500 to stipend artists and small businesses who might participate in the work group. And we know it works in other cities. Uh, more than 81 other localities around the country already either have required ordinances for art and private development or guidebooks online. Um, so we would not be the first people starting this. And at the end of the day, we believe this drives the mayor's key priorities of increasing local hire and wage equity and increasing quality of life in public spaces. Um, and we see this as a one-time investment to really close that loop um, and to create a more beautiful, productive, vital Nashville. Great, so I have a couple of questions. You Lovely. said one-time investment, yes. so the investment of 57.5 would be one-time, not reoccurring? Correct. Um, but you've got a project manager that I assume in year two, and I see artist see, workshops is 5,000, so I'm not seeing right. that. We see it as an 18-month project over two fiscal years, so it's a one-time project, but we think it would occur over an 18, over two fiscal year period. I see, okay, so that's that's why it's more money, okay, all right. Um, couple of questions. Sure. Um, don't see Neighborhood Resource Center or IT reflected as part of the team here, so talk to me about that. I have discussed it with Keith, and they're, they're it's fine. They're just not listed as a partner, sort of. It's, it's, it would basically be adding a series of web pages to the existing IT, so IT is aware of this. I have not vetted this with Neighborhood Resource Center, but we can easily Okay. Just you talked about neighborhood associations yeah. um, and the hub yes so are you guys part of the hub pro conversation yes. so would this be another like I could get to your department through the hub so we could be tracking sure we could stuff. easily lay, we, we hope to network this the portal the landing page basically from a variety of different places pu public and private so that more citizens can access that and well, last and not least, but not least, that you you mentioned that the uh, developers are you said they're doing this anyway. So is this just an opportunity to put the information in one place so that they'll know what to do? Is is that the is that the goal so, here, or just so some of them? I think what is happening is that there is a high desire. We talk with three to five developers a month who want to do this, and then get so confused by how many things are out out there and the process that they simply stop. So we believe that by clarifying this information and putting it up front and continually building the community of developers through training and technical assistance through our partnership with ULI and the Design Center, um, so they, they, when they have information when they come to planning and zoning that kind of comes to them at the front end, that we will begin to sort of ratchet up the demand. Does that and, make sense? And because I'm sure people watching probably would like to know. So I'm a private developer, I have a wall, mm -hmm. can't I paint it? Anything I want? It depends. <laughs> Does it? 
<laughs> Does it, it depend? Um, I can't if paint. If you have like, a piece I, of art, yes. It, well, it is a, can I paint a dog? <laughs> yeah. I bet you they'll. It will. Can I paint a dog on the side of my wall? Like, let, let's take the I believe in Nashville. Yes. That's that's, that's, a that's not a sign, though. No, there no, are there are federal there are there are commercial and free speech differentiations between signs and art. Okay, so I don't and know what it is. And we regulate. I don't know those. what it is. I'm I, I'm so so, yes. but I'm uh, I've got a building. I want to put. Yes. I believe in Nashville on it. Do I have to go get a permit to do that? No, it depends. <laughs> Why the heck would I have to get a permit to put I believe in Nashville on my private wall? So the, the answer is it, it depends, and it depends on oh whether or not <laughs> it depends on whether or not it's advertising. Right. So, I believe in Nashville. Which if prior to when that was first painted was not part of a company brand, but now is a company brand. So if Stella Artois said they wanted to paint a giant beer can wall, not to pick on Stella Artois, it was just the first thing that came to mind, that would be a sign, and the answer would be no. Um, that is, those are, you know, Supreme Court level decisions about the differentiation between free yeah. speech and no, commercial speech. So I want to paint about a, a, a sad little dog that says, I'm going to come back and get your brother next time. As long as that sad little dog is not an advertisement for a pet company, no, you're okay. fine. That would be the mural downtown. Yes. That makes me cry every time I see it. Yes. Okay. But that's, like, but, I could just do that, I, but, right? At, yes, but you might be confused, and you might call Bill, I am you might confused. call me, and you might call Clearly, some other. this has you, confused me. Right, so you, and, that's just, and that's just with a mural. That's not <laughs> with a sign, a light, uh, anything else um, that you might want to do. There, public art moves way past murals, and there are a lot of questions um, that people often have. So if you are confused, imagine right. my that's friend developer, and out. that's what we want to clarify, because Bill and I could answer that with an infographic that was clear to the general public and, and go five had... levels down if we could, which would save both of us a lot of stuff. Okay. All right, so, there, so that gets me to the next point. Would I be saving some time yeah. on staff and, and yeah. effectiveness for you and uh, Bill's staff that they don't have to answer this repeatedly? Uh, I think so, and, and I, it might not just be our staff. Bill absolutely, with okay. our staff, because we feel these questions all the time. So, okay. absolutely. Right. Okay. Any questions, Ty? I really don't understand why this costs you money. This seems to me something that you just ought to be doing in the normal course of your business and providing uh, good customer service. Well, we are. It's just we have 1% projects that the council and other community people are demanding that we do and not enough staff time to do this and that. I don't believe it requires an additional staff person. I don't think, there are other, there are other communities in the country that have a full-time staff person that does nothing but this, that man answers the private developer side. We don't believe, based on the source of 1% funding, that we can allocate that, and we don't currently, we would have to take someone off a 1% project to manage this <laughs> capacity gap. We believe that 90% of the questions could be managed if we just did this portal, and then it would reduce staff time for Bill's team, my team, planning team, et cetera. What are these stipends? that you have yeah, listed in So here. the work group, we would like to include um, some neighborhood associations for input and artists, um, and we would want to pay those folks to participate in a work group. We would do this as part of our normal course of Metro business, but other people we would be asking to participate in might not do that. Are you talking about creating new regulations? No. Oh. I don't think so. I would, I, I, we would work hard to make no new regulations, but to clarify the ones that are there and make them easy. We might stumble across something that we need to fix in this process that we would work to do. So for example, just recently, we've been working with Public Works around, an artist came to us wanting to do a mural on a um, an easement, and we found out that there was Let's just say it was incredibly complicated. We worked together with legal and public works to verify so there's one clear process for an artist who wants to do that. My sense is once we get into this, we might find more of those processes that need to be clarified. Seems like every case is going to be totally unique, though. It's what well, it not necessarily. Like if we can get one process that works for that request, then it, then we can manage it. And to that point, Rich, I mean, the, the concern right now is every single one of these is managed as a one-off versus okay. if we could go through this work group, get to the bottom of the processes, 
then we would manage them and then the general public would know, yep, that's what I need to do. Nope, that's what I don't need to do. And it would be, I'm, I'm imagining, Bill and I talked about this, I think 10% of them, they're gonna still have to come to one of the departments for some clarification, but the vast majority of cases, I think, if we went through this process, would get there. Well, uh, let, me, let me make sure. So you're creating just basically a guidebook to, to walk you through on the majority of stuff, but it sounds like to me the value is actually to have a person, a resource, that if I'm a developer, that, the, that I'm working with that developer on the front end to say, hey, you should include some art as part of your deal and let me help you understand how that art might materialize as part of your development. That's not part of this proposal, but that's actually where I thought, think there might be some value. I think there might be some value there too. I think that the vast majority of this could be self-taught. I, mean, I think the other side of this that does this in pr proposal does include is the development of local artist pool. So what well, we how does that happen? Well, that's, we are doing that as part of our daily work. Like, right, so, so how, I mean, I guess that it's just a, it's a you're, you're basically saying here's a list of people who, to a developer, here's a list of people who paint murals, here's people who do sculpture, yeah, sorry. and it's just basically a, a landing site where it just has a list of people. Is that kind of the extent of it? That's the starting yeah, okay, point, yes. Okay, okay. It, but is there more? Well, we, we would be constantly adding and subtracting from that as people live, come, okay. grow, change, add more to their career. In addition, it would be other subcontractors. So someone who knows how to install an art bike rack, someone who knows how to do this kind of metal. I mean, there's with art, it's not just the creation of it, it's the installation and management of it as well. And there are lots of subs. And, and Audra was here a while ago talking about this idea of makers and, mm -hmm. and another kind of list. I mean, I think you should have a conversation with her about what and we've been, she's we've, thinking. We've been definitely talking, we are, I'm very familiar with the made stuff. This is very specific to kind of the public art space, but yes, happy to talk about that and where this would live. Okay. Answer any questions? Okay. 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 Rich, good. Good. Thank you. Great, thanks so much guys, appreciate you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.